Yes, guys, how you doing? Welcome back to the Spurs Talk Show. I am Sean Butler. Happy Saturday. I hope you are all doing careful things that are wonderful, that keep you happy and healthy, yes, enjoying guys, yourself. I have... Uh, oh, hang on a second. I've got my Instagram coming through. We've got some, uh, some, some new stuff happening on the show today, guys. We're bringing in... It's a brand new show. It's called On The Other Hand. This is episode one. It's similar to Devil's Advocate. But Devil's Advocate is a kind of routine show that I have with Johnny and Dave where we try to debate the things and, and pick pick the bones out of it. But on the other hand, there's going to be a new series where we're similar sort of thing where I take the other side of the coin or they, they take the other side of the coin. And we're going to try and kind of figure out where the right balance is in a conversation, where the kind of truth, not that there is ever, ever any truth in subjective things, but where we can figure it out. And we've got the debutant. He's not his debut on the show, but it's been a while. Phil P, I'm sure you guys know him, Tottenham season ticket holder, takes his whole family there. So he's got some really uh, emotional and um, uh, passionate takes, I will say, on Daniel Levy at the moment, the season ticket stuff. And we want to get as many different voices on here as well. So I'm going to do my best to, to listen and, and to empathize and, and then give the other side of the coin where necessary. But what it's worth, guys, this show is on Spotify. It's not live on Spotify. It will be on Spotify. I'm trying to make sure everyone is aware of where you can find me. If YouTube isn't your thing, if you're at work and you can't have the thing open and you want to listen, then you can get these podcasts on Spotify. Link in the description. And today we are beta testing for the first time. Uh, we're going to go live on Instagram. But if you are going to watch this on Instagram, then after an hour, after 60 minutes, it will cut off. So if you are on there and you want to catch the second half or the second part of the show, if we're still going after an hour, then you will have to pivot back to YouTube or check it out on Spotify or Twitter and all the other stuff, all the other places we are. Let's uh, get straight into it. Let's bring Phil into the chat. How you doing, Phil? Welcome back to the channel, mate. I'm all good, mate. I'm all good. How are you, Shawnee? Good, mate. Yeah, Saturday. Always better on a Saturday than I am on a Monday. I'm looking forward to uh, looking forward to tomorrow. I enjoyed last night. I went to the under-21 game. I was just talking to you about it backstage at Boreham Wood, which I didn't know have uh, sold their soul to the devil. I didn't realise that Arsenal play all of their home games at that, at that stadium. But a good yeah. game. Tottenham dominated the first half, Phil, and we got the goal, Sunsot Bell, from a corner. Um, and then second half, it was all Arsenal. And by the end of it, we were hanging on. Um, but 1-1 one, one was the draw and we stayed top of the under-21s. Do, do you follow the under-21s much, mate? Not that closely, but you know what? I was looking at some of the fixtures a few weeks ago because I used to be um, in a different life, quite involved in the sort of youth um, team football and whatnot because uh, my bro played. Um, so, you know, I, 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 I did a fair tour of duty around the... Uh, the circuit back in the day as a spectator, not, you know, enough, you know, right. I wasn't coaching. I wasn't scouting. I wasn't there in any other professional uh, capacity other than uh, sort of in the owner's enclosure, I suppose. Uh, was he playing but, under 21 level for Tottenham or? No, no. He, well, it was, um, it was, well, he played in a few different clubs, but he came through at Watford, but um, okay. he did play at White Hot Lane though, mate. He played uh, for, I don't know whether it was the under 21s. I can't remember what age group it would have been. Maybe it would have been the resis when, res you know, reserve team football is still a thing. And, yeah, uh, yeah he, he played at White Hot Lane and marked Stefan Everson out of the game. So that's how old he is. <laughs> how old I am. Stefan uh, Everson, yeah, wow. Yeah, back in the day. But, um, yeah, it's interesting because, obviously, you get a – I think it's it's fascinating level of football because, you know, it is – you get a real good understanding of how the players stack up against one another. And, of course, a lot of the players that I saw coming through um, – mm ended up being uh, really prominent players in, you know, over the probably last 20 years of of, of English football. So it's um, it was fascinating. So I'm, I want to get back into it, to be fair, because it's really fascinating to see players come through. I mean, round the corner from where my mum and dad live uh, in Bushill Park in North London, Enfield, um, mm. was just round the corner from, uh, I think, Bobby Smith used to live around there. And... Okay. Um, Stephen Carr actually was in his digs. His digs as a YT at Spurs was just round the corner from there. So, wow. uh, you know, a bit of a Spurs connection. And actually, um, I don't know whether he was a Spurs fan or not, but Des Walker, uh, obviously you'll never yeah. beat Des Walker uh, <laughs> until we did in the, uh, in the, in the final in 91. Yeah. Have that, have that, have that Cluffy. Um, <laughs> he, um, he, uh, he grew up on the sort of road, um, sort of 
adjacent to uh, my mum and dad. So it, it's a bit of a hotbed of football around there. So, yeah, but look, mate, mm. I'd, I'd be I'd be up for it. I know uh, you and Johnny, uh, especially Johnny's got encyclopedic knowledge of all levels of uh, of Spurs. So it'd yeah, be, Johnny's uh, amazing. Yeah, quite along to a game. So yeah, when Johnny talks, I listen, mate, because uh, you know when you go to the games, you've got um, a good impression of what you know what the teams are doing and what the players what the players that are coming through might actually be all about. So yeah, look, it, it, God bless you for going down there, mate, and especially on deadly grounds, Boreham Wood. You know, Do you know what I didn't realize. I can say I didn't realize it was um, it was deadly ground, and and it was interesting because the stadium they only opened two state uh, two two um, ends of it, and they only intended to open one side. But then there was so, it was so busy, and Arsenal. There were so many kids there. It was brilliant. It was free to get in, and there was just Arsenal and Tottenham fans all mixed in. There was no problems, yeah. no trouble, but there was a lot of banter. Um, but it was great. It was it was a really, really, really good experience. Mate, for now me, I know why you were there. It was free to get in. You were there, free mate. To get in. You know what I mean? Yeah, I don't pay You're advocating sky high ticket prices, but you go anywhere for a free game of football, wouldn't you, son? <laughs> <laughs> it took me an hour and 45 minutes to get there you know like the rest of the guys that were there probably come from north like just a little yeah, cheeky right. free friday night for the kids but no i had to uh i had to spend an hour and a half in the traffic but listen honest to god it was, uh, it was brilliant to me i met i met jamie donnelly's father briefly um johnny got a picture with with uh, jamie donnelly after the game yeah, that, uh, yeah. jamie donnelly from like it looks head and shoulders above that level arsenal have got a couple of players uh i forget their names one is a 16 year old who i think he already made his debut for Arsenal in the cup recently the, in the first team he's a striker and he looks really 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 good he was the guy who got the goal in the end but they've also got another player who looks like a little um Bakayo Saka um sort of he looks really really dangerous but for me uh, from Tottenham's perspective just quickly not not that we're going to dwell too much on that stuff but um I thought Donnelly looked fantastic in the first half but I tell you what the, the goalkeeper Gunter I've been talking a lot on this channel and I'd love to get we'll, we'll talk about it uh, one of the kind of segments I have for you um about what we need in the summer, what what we need to kind of kick on. And obviously, there's a lot of, I don't know, sort of simmering debate around whether or not Fraser Forster is the kind of guy that we need that's reassuring to play this system in a world where Vicaria was to get injured or something was to happen. I personally, like, I admire and respect Fraser Forster. I thought he's had a good spell since he's been here when he's been asked upon, but I don't really trust his his footwork. I don't really like the idea of him having to play sweeper keeper and try and run out and clean things up and you know, so I'd, I'd rather us look in a different direction, but it's obviously difficult to go down that path. But I didn't know, you know, what the standards are. Austin, Whiteman, not sure they're going to cut the mustard. But you've got Josh Keeley, who was on loan, at, I think, at Barnet, or is it on loan at Barnet? Uh, and of course, Vicario went to uh, watch him, I think, this week, which was nice. But then you have this guy, Gunter, who was the guy who I think he was the captain of the 17s and the 18s in the cup finals last year when they won the lift of the trophies. He must have made 11 saves last night. Absolutely sensational against the Arsenal. You know, I know it's on a smaller level, but, you know, the future's bright in that department. I do really think that kid looks like, well, it's my, my first glimpse of him really in, up, up close, but um, yeah, really impressive, really impressive performance from him. Um, anyway, anyway, put that to one side. I just want to, uh, we've we got a lot to talk about, mate. Austin, Austin. Go on. Sorry, sorry, Phil. Are yeah. you on a, are you on a delay, mate? Brandon I mean, Austin a delay. can just concentrate on... Mate, I hope I'm not. Can you? Am I coming through? Brandon, I Austin think you want to just concentrate do you want, do you want to just jump, on, uh, you want to just jump out for a split second there, Phil. Do you want to just jump out and jump back in? Is that possible? Yeah, I think you're on. delayed a little bit. Yeah. Nice one. Just while we're waiting for Phil, I'll say hello to a few people there that have come in. We've got Eugene in the house. Good to see you, Eugene. He's saying a big up, everyone. Levy out. Robin Owens in the house as well. Good to see you. Hasper saying um, we will never buy a £100 million player. That's why we'll never win on trophies under Levy and Inigwas. We're going to discuss part of the discussion today. He's back in. Here he is. Is that better, Am Phil? I back? Am I back? Yes, mate. Sounds Beautiful. good to me. Beautiful. What were you saying I, about um, I was just saying, Yeah, I was just saying maybe uh, maybe the reserve goalkeepers can just concentrate on tapping up young Crystal Palace players because they seem to be doing a good job at that. So, you know. <laughs> You've got to be <laughs> multifaceted as a goalkeeper in the 21st century, Sean. You can't just be, you know, good at shot stopping. You've 100%. Got to play with your feet. You've got to tap up Eze. You know, yeah. there's a lot of different levels to the game these days. So, yeah. 100%, mate. Listen, we're, we're going we're gonna to start to get into the, the sort of nitty-gritty of why you're here. Obviously, we've got a lot to talk about, a lot of passionate stuff. Before I do, just let me get um, say hello to a few guys that have uh, come in and spent their Saturday afternoon with us. Kev G saying, we'll never spend £100 million on a player. 
And that ends any hopes of a Champions League or a Premier League. We're going to talk about that. Chris is in the house. Good to see you, Chris. Good to see you, Rhythmic. Good to see you, Dan. Tot Spurs, Phil P. Oh, he's, Phil P's with me. Uh, Drew Zilla, good to see you, my man. Uh, Chris Agomba, Solista, good to see you, mate. Love your uh, piano or your guitar stuff on um, on the on the Twitter. I hear all the, uh, we listen to them every day. Nikki Boy's in the house, good to see you, mate. Uh, Blaine Devlin, hey Blaine, good to see you, mate. Big up to you. Member for seven months, and this is your uh, membership uh, super chat thing. Big up Sean and chat, as always, come on you Spurs. In my opinion, those against Levy need to look at how bad FFP is for other sides. Chelsea have spent £1 billion and are nowhere. I'm going to start, I'm going to keep this one starred, Blaine, because this is obviously part of the conversation we're going to go in. I'm going to get Phil's take on it in just a second. Um, spending £100 million, says Liston, and over is extremely unusual and has happened eight times in world football and three times in the Premier League. Yeah, I've got all of the um, the top Premier League transfers detailed to show us because I don't think there's many successes. Um, so it's an, we'll, we'll get to that as well. Good, good to see you, Tom. Drew Zilla, member for eight months. Big up, Drew. Good to see you, mate. Big up, Sean. Don't forget to smash all those likes, you lovely people. 100%, guys. I, I forget to ask um, as much as I uh, would like to. Can you hit the like button for me? And also, if you haven't already, hit the subscribe button. And even if you have, double check you still are because YouTube's on a mad thing at the moment. I've lost 400 subscribers in three like, three days last week. They just went bang, unsubscribe then, unsubscribe, unsubscribe. I reached out to YouTube and I said, what's going on? And they said, oh, it's probably just we're, we're sweeping up bots or something. I was like, yeah, but you're not because I know these people. I know the people in real life. They say they keep getting unsubscribed. And they're selling selling me some yarn that we have the greatest propagation and proprietary software to figure this stuff out. Trust us. I'm like, I don't trust you at all. Your software sucks. <laughs> but <laughs> anyway, uh, let's see what, what Cantab, Roy Vicken, Totspurs, Liston, Gary, Reese. Good to see you, Reese. Good to see you, Gary. Um, what else we got here? Blaine, super chat from Blaine. Really appreciate you, mate. It's a nice, lovely way to start the show. Non-Spurs related, just a big thank you to those who donated, shared, liked my cycling challenge. Finished on Monday and we raised 650 quid. Massive, massive well done, Blaine. I was going to reach out to you about that. I thought I'd let your thighs recover. Um, I'm sure you're uh, sure you're absolutely exhausted and aching, but congratulations, wonderful cause. And um, yeah, I don't know if it's too late to donate, but if it, if it isn't... It's never uh, too late Blaine, to donate, Sean. It's never too it's late. It's not to too donate, late to donate. It, if it isn't Blaine, stick the uh, stick the link in or DM me the link on Twitter, mate, and I'll stick it back into uh, the chat and see if we can get some more some more nuggets for you, buddy. But well done, mate. Congratulations. Uh, I, wanna, I, I, wanna... I need to double check actually because I think when when you first mentioned it on on the you know uh, whenever it was maybe a month or so ago, I'm sure I donated, but I I need to double check if I haven't, Blaine. I will, but uh, you know you might be lucky and get two. I used to love doing that to people, sort of. You know, sending around the old begging email at work, and uh, someone <laughs> would end up sponsoring me twice. I was like, "It's not my no. fault. You're you your admin shop." Yeah, yeah. Pay it? attention. Pay attention to what you're doing. Yeah. That's all we can do. But Blaine, I really appreciate the support, my man. I will um, listen. I don't. I hate doing this because I think that every time it comes in, YouTube takes its slice. But I, I'm I'm going to go and put that money back into your thing. So send me the link, and um, and I'll and I'll put it into the chat, mate. And I'll get it up in a second. When once we get going, I let on the, in the interest of time, I know Phil's got a busy evening, so I don't want to uh, sort of take up too much time. But be good to see you all, and uh, keep the likes coming and the subscribes. Keep your questions coming in. If you've got questions, put a queue in front of it, and if they're interesting, then I'll, I'll we can we can discuss it. Just want to say a quick shout out to you, Amir. Great to chat with you last night, mate. You were at the football with me. Was well, an unexpected twenty minutes at the end where we were talking about um, ancient theology and uh poly polytheism and stuff it's out of nowhere and i loved every second of it i'd like to have more of that in the future um phil let's start mate let's start before we get into the ticket prices thing because i know i know you've got you want us to talk about that stuff but i do want to get some of the kind of the the kind of more uh i guess easier stuff out of the way <laughs> shall we say right and um let's start with eric dyer he's he's had a big interview and he's gone through loads of things. He's talked about his relationship with Toby out of Viral. He's talked about his relationship with Musa Dembele, Harry Kane, yada, yada, yada. And that's for a different conversation. The point, obviously, of today is to talk a little bit and, and try and make everything about the Levy Enoch ownership and try to get your, everyone's opinions on it. And Eric Dyer had this to say on Daniel Levy. Daniel is a very strong businessman. He's an extremely difficult man to negotiate with, but he looks after the club. I just find it... Funny, when I went to the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium to see Levy out, 
And I'm thinking this guy over the last 10 years has built the best infrastructure in football, best training ground, best stadium, and a team during all of the time that they've stayed relatively competitive, reaching the Champions League final in 2019. He goes on to say, you look at some other clubs struggling now that financial fair play is becoming a big thing. That's where I have a lot of respect for Daniel. Look at Arsenal when they built their new stadium. You saw that decline of the team. They were financial constraints as they built. There were financial constraints as they built. And only now they're finally coming back. You never hear Tottenham in any of these FFP conversations. It's baffling to me that a Tottenham fan could ever be upset with someone who looks after a club in that way. Um, I don't know, parting shots from uh, from a player that received a hell of a lot of um, you know tough commentary from sections of the fans. He's gone after a certain section of the fan base now. Phil, you are an advocate of that section that he's talking about. Well, what what have you, you know, what say you to Eric Dyer and Eric Dyer's comments? Is there truth in there or is it something else? Yeah, look, I think as far as Dyer's concerns, you know, let's have, let's have, meet up, Eric. Let's have a tear up. No, I'm joking. Um, <laughs> look, I think there's, there's, there's two elements to it, okay? My first reaction is pretty knee-jerk and pretty anti and probably would get a bit sweary, but we don't need to act like that on a, a chilled Saturday afternoon. Mm -hmm. Look, I you always... Yeah, of course. Um, it'll probably get to that as I build up, Sean. As you wind me up okay. a bit more, I'll probably... You That's know, fine. Up we'll warm up. Yeah, we'll, um, we'll warm you up, yeah. But look, I, I always like to listen and take on board what players or anyone inside the club is saying because they've got levels of access that we as, as fans just don't have. You know, he's had a working relationship with, with Levy for nigh on 10 years, right? Mm -hmm. He sees backstage. He's not just, you know, one of the players, you know, in terms of on the stage performing. He sees backstage. He's obviously got his take on it. The thing I would say is, and this this is something I, I sort of um, would throw back, you know, a lot of times when, when you position it, Sean, about how well he's done with the sustainability, Levy and, and the whole leadership of the club, is it's a bit like... Um, it's a bit like Bill Belichick from the NFL for Johnny and all the NFL fans out there or wider sports fans or Roy Keane. It's out of their playbook. You know, it's just your job. Do your job. You know, it really, Levy is doing a good job in the financials. I'm not here to argue he's not. He has done great, right, in terms of yeah. those things. But in a way, he's he's doing well, but it's just the others are doing such a bad job job if you know what I mean like Levy's almost on a level he's almost you know doing what he should be doing albeit with all the other deals that he's done and how he's grown the financial strength of Spurs particularly since 2019 when we've moved back into White Hart Lane um, you could argue but I just think comparing him to the likes of Todd Bowley and maybe the Forest chairman and a few other really left field characters you know they're just literally betting the farm on black they're literally coming into the you know they're playing high stakes right. um with their football club and the future of their clubs from what i can see now and this is the thing certain people that have gone pro levy or maybe anti levy out or in account always say that oh what if like you know careful what you wish for type mentality uh, which yeah. I understand, you know, there is a, that element of even now, like, you know, I question myself, would I want the club to be bought or invested in by, you know, the Saudi royal family or someone from one of the Emirates come in and, and you know, then you've got the whole sports washing thing. And yeah. whereas I think most people in this day and age would just say, look, it is what it is. A bit like the ticket prices, mate. It is what it is. What can we do? What can the average Joe Bloggs football punter do about who owns a club? Pretty little, really. Uh, right. But we've still Derek. Going back to it though, Dyer for me, I, I'm interested in what he's saying. But also, he's and this will maybe be some a theme that we maybe explore a bit later on, Shawnee. But really, you it's becoming more transactional football, right? It is, and we're all just little tiny cogs in a massive, massive machine, and. Um, yeah. You know, as that become as we're seeing more as customer reference numbers, 
and we're paying through the nose for it, then yep. I think rightly you start to question the establishment that's providing you with the entertainment. And you can then ask, well, is it right just to be competitive? And look, the other thing I would say, he's absolutely right to compare us to Arsenal because that's the closest probably um, you know, comparison to make. Us moving into New Whitehall Lane and then moving into the Emirates um, is a... It took them eight years really to get close. to lift the trophy after, after they moved yeah. into the Emirates. And, and the other thing you've got to say is they did have to sell off a lot of prize assets. But the thing I would always counter to that is, and how I would parry that type of argument, as, as Dyer's laid it out, is Levy always told us that the player spending and the, the, the football finance part of it was ring-fenced. Now, as much mm -hmm. as I'll take them on face value and say, OK, yeah, that it did roughly coincide with the self-imposed self-imposed two-window transfer ban. So either it was because he's so hands-on with the transfers that he took his eye off the ball, which I think is what he's alluded to in some of his end-of-season end uh, statements a few years back. Right. And he Ooh. said, right, this is something we've got to rectify. Or we didn't have the money. So it's, I think it's probably one or the other. Or maybe a bit of both. Yeah. Phil, can you do me a favour, mate, and just uh, I, I heard everything you said there, but your your uh, voice and your and your face is now lagging again. Is there any chance you can just drop back out and drop back in? Is that yeah, possible? I will. If if it doesn't work, mate, I'll try a different location in uh, in Phil okay. P Towers. Yeah, no worries. Mate. I, I, I think we're, actually, I think we're okay. I think oh, okay. Let, yeah, I think we're okay. I think we're caught back up now. So let's let's uh, let's see what, what, where we're going with it. I think my, I, my monotone voice really affects the router. I think you know my. <laughs> <laughs> not monotone at all i thought it was quite uh quite volatile yeah. it was going to get more volatile as we go through the uh yeah, the questions so like so eric dyer so you know sort of ring fencing eric dyer's comments itself you don't necessarily disagree with him in terms of um like what he's pointing out is kind of is reality in, in terms of the fact that he's protected the asset that the sustainability of football of tottenham is not at risk whereas it might be in other places the ability to do and conduct business as as a club would like to, might be taken away from teams like Nottingham Forest and their ownership, even though they might have ambitions to spend more money. Aston Villa might have ambitions to spend more money. I think I think Unai Emery and the Aston Villa um, chairman, I forget his name, has actually come out and said, look, we would love to spend more money, but we're not allowed to. I don't think Daniel Levy will ever be guilty of feeling like he wants to, he would like to spend more money. I think he, I think we can all agree that he doesn't, he's not got that kind of, that willingness to put his hand in his pocket. Um, but at the end of the day, by hook or by crook, the the rules around what you can do have st started to kind of move towards Tottenham in a beneficial manner, at least. Um, and we're not at risk, which is the first and foremost cornerstone for me, the cornerstone role of any custodian of a football club, which is all he is. He's the owner right now, but he is a custodian because at some point he'll be gone. And at some point, someone else will come in. Same with any manager, same with any players, whatever else. But the first and foremost, the cornerstone is that you you keep the club as a going concern, right? And, um, you know, at times recently, sure Everton it. looked like they weren't going to be, they, they might go into administration. You could see, say the same about Derby County and loads of other clubs maybe on the second tier of football. So his, at least in his, his primary focus, his primary role of keeping the club alive and sustainable, he's got the box ticked. Right, but in terms of whether or not he's doing enough to make us competitive, which is the second and probably more important thing for most of our fan, you know, for most fan base, um, maybe there's question marks. Yeah, but my thing would almost be, and this goes back to what a lot of players in the greatest team that we've ever had in in the '61 double team and the subsequent teams throughout the '60s would say about Bill Nick. Bill Nick would come in, and they thought they've had the best performance they've had, and you know, scored a couple of goals, whatever it might have been, and he'd hardly even look at them. And then, you know, that's where the famous quote, a pat on the back is only, you know, a foot or so away from a kick up the arse. You know, <laughs> I'm not going to... Listen, Danny boy, I'm not going to... Look, mate, I'm not going to give you flowers for just doing your job. And, and even more away from football, Sean, you know, any company director is actually beholden on them to, you know, the least you can do is keep is keep the business that you're running, you know, afloat. You know, that, that's oh, literally yeah, like yeah. chapter one, page one of what you're meant to be doing. Right. So he, yeah, but I, just wanted, I just wanted to kind of like yeah, ascertain that that is thing. at least that that, that's the bare thing. minimum, and he has he has done that. Whereas other other owners with lofty ambitions have 
you go all the way back to Leeds, I think was probably the most perfect example of a huge club that had ambitions beyond their means and they were yeah. at the top tier and then what happened to them, right? So but I'm not suggesting that's like, enough. Yeah, I'm not suggesting that's enough to give to give Daniel Levy a 10 out of 10, but that's at least the kind of the ground zero. After that, everything else is is the sugar on top, but how much sugar is is too sweet? And I don't know if there's enough sugar. We're going to figure that out right now, Phil. But this is, yeah, we will, mate, we will. But this is the thing with Leeds and the, the obviously the, the sort of throwaway thing back to people that you say, oh, you, you don't want to do a Leeds, do you? you? What if we were Leeds? What if, what if we'd had Risdale? You know, Leeds, you know, Leeds, you know, had their moment in the sun, went kaput, went down and came back up again and we were still just like you know bobbing along just you know doing our thing Levy's like the type of bloke on a night out that just comes out after work has a couple of beers and then pisses off home boring as hell nothing ever <laughs> happens to him do you know what I mean yeah. I, you know I want a bit of rock and roll mate get get a bit lively get a few ciders in you and you know see who you end up dancing with let's go well, would you come would on. you argue would you argue and I don't want to get down caught too much down the rabbit hole of of looking at the kind of the 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 minutiae of the individual accolades over the years, but in a 22, yeah. was it 23, 24 year um, span now, I always kind of reference the, the statistic that, you know, nine, I think it's now something like 94.1% of all trophies that could have been won in the English, uh, English system yeah. um, since his time have been won by the same five clubs and the other five or 6% have been won by about seven or eight others. Leicester are being, the one that's got two and then Tottenham being part of the group of six that have, have won one each, but yeah. the, the majority, the overwhelming majority are, are being controlled by Manchester city, Chelsea, Arsenal, United, Liverpool. Three of those clubs have always generally been bigger than Tottenham. And the other two have come up because mm. of mm. sugar daddy ownership, reckless spending, but without the rules to curtail it. But at the same time, also, um, reckless to a point, but without any, when the well is that deep, it didn't really matter. And then the fact that Chelsea now have been taken over by someone and they had the ability through, I always want to reference, you know, make sure that, that this also is kind of recognized at least that for those people that look at, you know, owners like the Arsenal, the Arsenal owners, the Cronkies, or, you know, even Sir Jim Ratcliffe now, when money comes, when new money comes into a club under this new, under the new model, the new system, it's not freebie. It's not a freebie like what Rabam yeah, yeah. Bramwich did, right? Abram Chelsea, Todd Bowley got a billion dollars wiped off of the debt of the club because of the political situation. And that was like a, a sort of bit of fortune for him, which maybe allowed him to spend the billion and thinking that he's still he's still walking into fair value. But the rest of them, Aston Villa, Arsenal, Tottenham, you are if you have if you have 100 percent control ownership of your club, then you have to put it on the books as debt. And if you don't, if you have a shareholder membership or a shareholder ownership structure, then you have to dilute the other shareholders in order to access the money. So there's so no I've such thing a as a freebie way, anymore. You know, I've got a third way. What about if when um, when old Smoking Joe gets out of Sing Sing, couldn't he sort <laughs> of, from whatever island he's on, you know, he's already got the Bond bad guy yacht. Surely, you know, he's got a few quid. Couldn't he get a few mercenaries from it, you know, get a few tanks and a few submarines and invade somewhere maybe if he invaded florida yeah you know, or the patagonia I, I think he already did that once upon a time before he, didn't yeah, he? he's tried so he's yeah. got form he's got form is what you're saying <laughs> basically <laughs> they could pump in two do one roman you're a part-timer yeah and you've had to take your toys home and piss off right yeah why, yeah, don't, yeah. why don't we go balls deep with two billion of debt by loads okay. of great players um, smoking Joe can invade uh, Florida and then he's forced to sell the club for trying to start World War Three, <laughs> and then you know that debt gets wiped off and we get a new owner. So I'm happy, you're happy, Spurs will win stuff over the next 20 years, and we still get rid of Levy. So you know, it's all good. I think this is a plan, Sean. Uh, I, I don't, I don't hate it to be honest, and it would create it would something to talk about. A lot of content there, you know, a lot of content. Was yeah. he right? Was he wrong? Florida was a democracy. Now we're getting uh, there's lots of things we can talk about. Listen. That, listen, <laughs> the Americans would love if he did it to Cuba. He could invade yeah, Cuba. There you go. There you go. Cuba's there you go. lovely. Look behind me, Cuba. Look, it's lovely. <laughs> Get involved. Oh, Phil, let me let me ask this bold, the bold question though, right? Because if, if you're if you're representing the Levy Out movement, yeah. given the fact, given the reality that the you know how upset them, that Levy Out are that I'm representing them today. They, you know, some of those boys will be absolutely gutted. They'll be like. Look, you you won't be the you're not you're oh, not certainly not the why, first why, and you certainly you know, won't be the last. Stagel's day off. We've had to 
yeah God like, i'm gonna be having i think i think now we've got the lag again phil so uh, i think we maybe need to just drop drop back out for a sec, split, split second and come back in if that's possible it's levy mate levy levy's on my case all right drop out and come back in no we're gonna get into this uh let me see what let me catch up with the chat for a second how are we doing here now florida's too well armed to invite you exactly they got guns everywhere down there they don't mind they don't mind um all right who's back phil let me ask this mate let me ask you this straight off the bat like we, we can reverse engineer this we'll start at the kind of yeah. end point and we'll come back to the reasons why because this is a free-flowing conversation but given the fact that the rules have changed and you look at a team like newcastle who have the world's richest family the world's richest pool of money that has invested into the club but they can't do anything and they have to sell alexander isaac or bruno Gramarish or whoever joe linton in the summer because the rules are so tight now it's a quick they've got all this money forcing its way to the top but they got that much of a hole to get to, to be able to um, spend. So the idea of sugar daddy ownership is largely kind of done anyway, especially for a club like Tottenham who don't have any more wiggle room in the areas of infrastructure. Newcastle United can rebuild their stadium and turn it into a hundred thousand seater stadium. If the owners want to spend 3 billion on that and sunk as a sunk cost, then Newcastle owners can do that. And then that can be their, their methodology of, of raising revenue streams over the next 10 years. That could be the way that they can raise the top number. And then in so doing raise the bottom number. There's no incentive for a sugar daddy to come to Tottenham. They can't do that. If they had the willingness to spend, they, they're not going to rebuild the stadium for me, Haringey council. I understand the rationale for why they limited it to 62,000, but we know you could fill the stadium four times over. But unfortunately, Transport links are what they are, and you can't. So if there's no inv if there's no ability to get juice from the squeeze in infrastructure, then the only ways to get juice from the squeeze is by making use of what you've already done. And Daniel Levy is doing, I think, and I think you, I hope you would agree. But if you don't, let me know. Um, he's he's doing everything he can to try to diversify the responsibility of revenue generation off solely off the heads or shoulders of Tottenham fans by going into rugby, NFL, Beyonce, Taylor Swift, whatever else. Formula One. So in terms of the ability to raise money that we can put into the team, Daniel Levy's already figured out most of the angles. I'm sure there's one or two that he's forgotten or missed. And we have there's, there's one big that. one. There's one big one. Okay. Well, well okay, I'll answer that first. Yeah. And then the, the ultimate question is if not him, then who? Who is the guy or the profile of a, of an owner that you would like to see come in? if they are already limited by their ways to spend money. Yeah. Actually, Sean, before I answer the first question, let me ask you something. Do you think in the current way that football finances work and, and the rules and regs, do you think that if we did have an outside investor, now, obviously, you made the point the other day on your show with with uh, the good show, I should say, great show with, uh, with Guy and Johnny, that... Mm. Obviously, that money that Radcliffe's paid to uh, the Glazers, none of that's going to Man U. That's all going to well, a small amount. Will yeah, but yeah, not but the majority. The, the majority of it is going straight offshore into yeah, the Bahamas. You, or wherever. you, you yeah. bought shares from another person, so that other mm -hmm. person's got that money, right? But if someone, if Levy was to go to partners or a you know a third party group of individuals or whoever to invest in Spurs. How could that could, could, with our spending power within FFP as it is now, is there a way of that being rooted f into the football club, either by, you know, sponsor, you know, White Hart Lane sponsored by, you know, whoever? Yeah. You know. Well, that, that's that's kind of it, right? So, only le only le legitimate sources. You can add debt to the books if you want to, and that's one mechanism of doing it. But ultimately, you know, Daniel Levy. I mean, look, yeah, you, you can add debt to the books if you want to, and the and the. So, if if an investor comes in, they're buying a stake from Daniel Levy and Joe Lewis and the, the Enoch Foundation. Yeah. So that money is likely going to be taken out, or at least a significant part of it is. But the rest of it, if you wanted to put it onto the books of Tottenham Hotspur, that has to go on as debt. Yeah. It has to go on as debt, right? So look, it has to go. On, it, ha it also has to go on as debt for what it's worth under the new rules. Just like they're, they're, I think the profit and sustainability rules also has this new thing. I, I forget the terminology, but I think it's called fair and reasonable. And so that's why uh, Manchester City are currently, you know, 
I think that Manchester City have got away with a lot of this over the last 10 years of that investigation because there wasn't this rule in place to suggest that yeah. sponsorship deals have to be valued at reasonable uh, rates. And I think in the past, City have you know, had businesses that have sponsored their football club that don't have any discernible service or product to offer, that have a PO box in some office in Mayfair somewhere, and yet they're sponsoring the football club for 5 million, 10 million a year, all that stuff. Super suspicious, but the fact that they put the rule in place now suggests to me that it wasn't in place for the period of review of what Manchester City are under, you know, being investigated for. And so likely a lot of those 115 charges yeah. will be dismissed. But from now on, if Tottenham wanted to have debt put on the books, fair and reasonable means that it has to be put somewhere close to the interest rate that is currently on offer to corporations, which is about, depending on the you know, where you look somewhere between six and 15%, which is another anchor around the football club. Um, so well, yeah, I, I just, it's, easy. it's interesting though, because, but theoretically you could do, especially with the revenue we've got now, we could probably, you know, it's a bit like people talk about the stadium debt, right? That is so insignificant compared to the money that we're bringing in. It's not even a mortgage payment, is it? It's more like a sort of personal loan payment, really. If you were to yeah. say from personal finance into, actually the football club finance but the one thing i would say the one area that we probably haven't explored as as much as a club is obviously football success because i think mm -hmm. now the big differentiator between our levels of revenue and the people above us in terms of rich list is winning things right how much more could we grow our fan base by how much more revenue could we bring in if we were regularly at the very top table challenging for honours now the difficulty is and this is the argument that a lot of the people may be leaning towards how i lean towards seeing the club and how the ownership is performing in terms of football would say well you know levy's not gonna and we'll get on to the 100 million pound figure but levy isn't going to sanction signing 100 million pound player or or say up in the spend every summer to 200 million or 300 million because actually you know, to, uh, as the saying you always say, the the juice isn't worth the squeeze, Sean, because what is a Premier League prize money? You know, the extra we'll earn out of it is only whatever it is, say yeah. 50 million. Why are you going to spend 300 million to earn 50 million? But the it's the it's the bolt-ons. It's the fact that you're then a Premier League winner and then you're going into this, you know, if you win the Champions League, you're going into the Super Cup. All these other little things and... Obviously, Nike, how much more are they going to pay? How much more is all the other sponsorships going to pay? I dare say there's already criteria in the contracts, if Levy's doing his job properly, we hope he is, that would already state if we win something that all the current sponsors have to, you know, stick in another few million pounds into the, into the pot if right. we win, right? So yeah. that's maybe an area we haven't explored, but it's just... Yeah, prize money... Prize money is massive. And you know what? The, when you look at the prize money, um, like it, it works on a logarithmic scale, especially in the Champions League. So if you get if you get out yeah. of the group stage, I'm not sure how it's going to figure out with the new system. I don't yeah. I haven't looked into it. But the previous system, if you get out of the group stage with the type, the prize money, the campaign money, her victory, the TV money, the spon most of your sponsors will have court clauses where they'll pay more for more exposure and you know, high level, all that stuff. So you're probably going to make. I always say you you get if you get to the champ if you qualify for the Champions League as a club like Tottenham, you're probably going to guarantee at least to get somewhere out of the group stage. If you qualify out, you're probably going to have about seventy million pound extra in revenues on your books than you would if you weren't. If you get to the last sixteen, add another another ten. If you get to the last quarters, add another fifteen, eighteen. If you get to the semis, add another twenty five, thirty. If you get to the final, add another whatever it is thirty. If you, if you win it. Obviously, you get more prize money, but with the additional pri the additional exposure, like you say, you, you know, you're going to get more more eyes on the various, you know, branding or whatever around the stadium. All of those clauses will kick in. So there's an exponential kind of logarithmic pattern to the prize money, and the same happens, but to a lesser extent with the Premier League. I think that you get an extra one and a half million pound for every additional spot until you get to the top three, and then I think it jumps up. And if you win it, then you get an extra ten million or something. Could be wrong. Don't quote me on those numbers, but. Obviously, there is massively more revenue available to a football club that does better. And I think the other area where Tottenham obviously can find massive revenue differentials where we've been terrible is in player trading. You know, we're not very good at producing young talent that we sell that we don't want. We're not very good at buying players 
and letting them go and recuperating. If we could figure those two areas out, then there's an extra 30, 40 percent of revenue. But Sean, who obviously the, the, the youth team player thing is a really hot button topic at the moment. Right. And, and right. you know, nurturing talent and being able to sell talent on obviously player pathway at Spurs has been uh, pretty much atrocious unless you literally are the best striker in England. You can't break into the team and then get sold for a lot of money. Right. But uh, thank you, Harold Kane. But the thing I would say, every Premier League club especially has been pretty abject at it, except for City. Chelsea have got worse at it, but when they were Chelsea as they were under Roman, they were also very good at it. But mm -hmm. again, that's a, by, a lovely byproduct of being successful. When you're Man City and you're winning, a, all the peripheral players have got to shut the hell up because you've just got to get on with it because everyone's winning, right? So you're going to just say, okay. And also they're, they're happy to do it, right? When you look at Manchester yeah. City, they are so willing to spend, work, like not world-class, but top, top class players are willing to spend 30% of the season on the pitch, 70% on the bench because they know that they're going to pick up two trophies for their haul at the end but, of the but season. also, except for... Um, I can't remember his name. Um, the lad from Leeds who's gone to West Ham, Calvin Phillips. Except for Calvin Phillips, most players come in and do play a regular amount of minutes. You know, it's probably only uh, De Bruyne and Haaland that are mainstay. And maybe now Foden, obviously, he's taking it on to a new level, Phil Army. Um, right. These players are nailed on, right? But the yeah. rest of them all rotate through, all rotate through. You know, Carl Walker dropped for the Champions League final. You can't moan, mate, because we're winning the thing. You know, 100%. dry your tears with the with the lanyard ribbon from your winner's medal, <laughs> right? <laughs> and enjoy it while you can, because you're perfect. probably going to have to sell it on eBay to pay for one of the kids or your, you know, whatever else you got. Yeah, going yeah, on. exactly. God bless him, exactly. mate. God bless him. He, he loves it. He loves it. The boy he just can't help himself. Mate, more talent. Uh, listen, as long as those some of those boys, some of those kids are boys, and half of the genes are going to be potential new future England right backs. You know, I'm I'm okay with it. Hey, listen, okay with what it. what Levy needs to do right is probably sign Carl Walker back, but tell him he's got to pay like 50 quid a ticket for his kids to get in the ground. And then the ticket <laughs> price thing will be gone, mate. You mate I, genu I genuinely gone. thought, I genuinely thought you were about to go off on a tent and talk about get him back and pay him as a stud. Like they do in horse racing. <laughs> you know? all, all we need you for is listen, your bro, testament. <laughs> listen, listen. <laughs> that brings a whole new element to youth training. Like get them up, get them real young. You know, listen, listen, I don't know what he's like around the Manchester city. Uh, women's team, but I would yeah. not. I wouldn't trust him around the, the Spurs women's team. So just keep keep no, it away. Exactly, 100%, 100%. Uh, God, God, bless, God bless Carl. Um, no, what I was what I was what I was trying to say is, mate, when you're at the very top level, when you're achieving, other teams will come in and pay for your talent. Do you know what I mean? Sooner yeah, or later, course. Man City are going to get a very very attractive bid for some of their crown jewels, right? And they will regularly yeah. get bids for these players. When Chelsea were in their pomp, people would come along and pay good money. Obviously, one of the issues we've got at football now is how broke everyone else is. So who's got the money to come along and pay the money for these players? Well, that's we're it. struggling. So, but look, one that's, thing that's, I wanted to just... What, you know what, that's a, it's, a, it's a massively important thing. When people consider the bottlenecks of FFP, and the PSR, the fallout from this is that there's another consideration, there's another bottleneck in terms of your ambitions. Even if Tottenham were to be, you know, uh, less frugal, more ambitious this summer, and that the finances looked healthy, and we're going to come on to Angie's um, quotes in a minute because there's there's the headline yeah. and then there's more context to it. It's quite yeah, an interesting yeah, yeah. breakdown. But even if Tottenham were to spend £100 million on a player, even if Tottenham were to spend you know, 300 million. Unfortunately, the other bottleneck that you create with the rules in football is squad size limits. You're only allowed to have 25 members. You have to have, you can only have 17 that are non-homegrown. You have to have, especially in Europe, you have to have four club train players in your squad. There's all these other considerations. And part of the, you know, I've been talking about it a long time. The fact that European football is broke, it, does, it hasn't allowed teams like Tottenham the ability to find um, viable outlets for the B tech players that we don't want anymore who aren't good enough to go to Europe and play for the top teams that do have the money. 
that's an issue. But there's an issue as well with teams, you know, Aston Villa, Wolves, whoever this Nottingham Forest, Everton this summer, they'll they might be some abilities to get that get in there and buy players. But if you're also looking at decisions around things like Timo Werner, I was having this conversation the other day. I'd love to get your take on it. Timo Werner at 15 million pound is value mm. for money on a just a player level, right? He's a good player, Champions yeah, yeah. League experience, he's a talent, but he does take up a squad spot. Yeah. He does take up a non-homegrown a non a non-homegrown yeah. spot. And so when you're figuring out whether or not it's a no-brainer to sign him, you also have to bake in, well, there's an opportunity cost in signing him. If you sign him, it means that you can't buy another player that might pop up and might become available through some unknown FFP struggle in some team or PSR, whatever struggle, some team in Germany, some team some team in, in England or wherever else. So there's all these other considerations just on the team over anything. I don't want to get too distracted by it, but I do want to get your take. Do you think there's value in there at 15 million or do you think that with the money, the powerhouse that we're becoming, that we could look elsewhere and find someone for a little bit more money that maybe offers a little bit more end product? I think that Werner, I mean, I, I, I think Werner's doing a good job, an okay job, but I think one of the issues that we've had over the recent past is, and, and we all know, look, Levy has spent the money, and this is the argument a lot of people say. Spurs have spent the money. Look how much money we have spent since we came back to White Hart Lane. We spent, mm. you know, we're up there in terms of spending it's just we've spent it badly you know the whole buy buy cheap buy twice mentality we sold Carl Walker right. we've been joking about the lad but since we sold him how many how much money have we wasted on right backs that right. weren't up to snuff right and do you we've hold that you be accountable for that ultimately he's got to be accountable for it because he's signing the checks or you know typing in the authorization code in transfers it's you know it's him at the top of the shop, so he has got to carry the can. But ultimately, right. it comes down to Hitchin or whoever else was was ID in the players, and they weren't good enough. But I think this goes back to something, and this is something that we talk about sort of in my family, my circle, a lot about Spurs. How many times, you know, whether it was Sissoko or a number of other different players, if we'd you know came along and actually after a dodgy start did a, an okay job, I think he won Player of the Year one year. But actually, if you added up all the 30 millions, you know, Lamella here, Sissoko there, all these, like, we've spent 25 to 30 million pounds on these players who have just also ran. Chop that, three of them out, and all of a sudden, you can buy a 75 million pound player and pay three times the wages, but your net result on the balance sheet is exactly the same, except yeah. for the fact, of course, now, Levy, everyone inside the club, and we as fans have all got our fingers burnt because of, oh, what about if Ndombele? You know, what about if we get Ndombele Mark II? We put all our eggs in one basket and then it turns out to be an absolute burger eating, you know, dud. Yeah. And, but I, I, we cannot be put off by that. I think the other thing, just to play devil's advocate or on the other hand, as we should say, yeah. is, you know, if you, if you concentrate the spending into higher quality players that are bigger amount then obviously you've got a higher risk of that one asset falling over. But back to your Werner question, right. there's definite value there and we probably will pull a trigger on it. And I won't be completely mad at it. I know a lot of people probably be screaming at the screen just now and I know some of them very, very yeah, I well. I see a few people saying we just don't want them. Don't want him. It's but, not good enough. But yeah. Exactly. Because actually, and you summed it up well in the question, Sean, it's great value. And I could definitely see him doing a job, but in this current environment where it is harder to ship players on, right, and where we could get value, I would say save that 15 million, save the wages, and actually go, and this is a technical term, balls deep and get <laughs> Eze, get Neto. If we got Eze and Neto, pretty much, or everyone in the Spurs camp will be happy, right? I don't well, know let, me ask, let me ask this though, Phil, right? I need to ask this. Happy. We're in a position, like, so we're going to get the, the, the Ange quote up in a minute in the detail. But just, you know, I'll, I'll bring it up as I'm, as I'm, as I'm talking about it. Because I, I do want to move into this stuff. And I, it's, obviously, we've been going for 50 minutes and um, I've we've got, got loads nowhere, of Sean. We've got nowhere yet, mate. We've got nowhere we've got yet. We've got, we've got absolutely nowhere yet. So we need, we need to, I mean, it's been a great chat, but we need to get into some of the, uh, some of the, um, the nitty gritties. So. 
I'm going to eat this chocolate biscuit while we uh, look at this quote. Hang on about. Let me get, where's it going? What am I doing here? So it starts yeah. with, uh, this is what Sky Sports put out. We're not in a position where we can spend a hundred million pound on a player. And I don't think we ever will be. Our competitors are. That's the kind of snippet. That's the takeaway from it. To me, I'm going to say it right now. I think we can and will be in a position where we need to. I don't think we have been in a position where we ca where we could have done and can because of the FFP rules, because of the fact that you can only spend a, ca a cap of 70% of your revenue in any given year on the, on, well, it will be 70% on the combination of your fees, your, your wages and your, your agents fees, all that stuff. Then, you know, a hundred million pound player is when you add that to the wages that they're going to sign on to the agents fees that it's going to take, plus all of the other things that are going on in your, um, in your fam, in your staff sort of financials already, it's going to be difficult to envision it with the rules that the way they are. However, I also think that the, the overriding arching emphasis here is that if Tottenham spent a hundred million pound on a Jack Grealish, you wouldn't also have been able to have got a Vicario, a Van der Ven, uh, a Porro, a new, a new doggy. We we had so much, we have so much deadwood that we had to get through that it was important for the first phase of this, including the Harry Kane money, to use it wisely. And at the start, you try to find the correct value for money. And we're going to go into Andrew's quotes because he does go into that stuff in a second. But the the idea that I don't think we could have spent a hundred million pound and also filled the holes of where there's so there were so many holes. It was like a sieve in our team. Yeah. But we don't have that problem going forward. I think now, and I want to before we get this up, I do want to ask you the, the overarching question is how many more players? How how many players are we away? Forget the value for a second. Just in terms of where is the weakness in our squad? How many players, in your opinion, are we away from being able to compete with Liverpool and Arsenal and City next year? Wow. Um, well, look, mate, I, I think, first of all, Sky Sports are, you know, <laughs> that, the most clickbaity thing you could ever have seen. Because, look, absolutely, are they quoting him? 100% they are. But if you listen to that whole segment, and right. one of the other journos did go back, and are you saying this for football reasons, or are you saying it for financial reasons? And he said, probably financial. But but then he went on to say, and I'm sure you'll read it out, but yeah, if if someone tells me we can... I'll find it. But he said, his feeling is, if they've got 100 million to spend, he'd rather buy two fifties, two players yeah. at 50. And then yeah. he jokes about, oh, look at me, look where I've come from and I'm talking about spending 100 million pounds on players. But yeah, exactly uh, there. I think he's got it here. Let's just quickly get it out yeah. of the way and then I want to go back to the question I asked you. I don't think we're in a position to spend 100 million on a player because that's not the case. I don't think we will ever be, it will ever be the case for the club. Our competitors are in that position. When you look at our transfer windows so far, I think we've done really well. The premise that we're in a good position, I agree with, but it's up to us to take advantage of that. If I had the luxury of a hundred bar, a hundred million, I'd rather get two fifty million pound players. That's wonderful to say. It could just be my background and my conservative nature of where I've come from. I've never been in that kind of position, and I've always felt it really important how you use the funds available, knowing they're not limitless. If we can, and someone tells me we can, I'll gladly spend it. It's not what you spend; it's how you spend it. I think our football club will be in a great position from a financial perspective to continue to grow our football team. But if we take bad decisions, we don't have an advantage. I agree that we're in a position where there is an opportunity for us during the transfer window to continue to build the team. I think I said in the past that we've still got a lot of work to do on the squad. I don't think we're anywhere near where we want to be. It will probably take a little bit more than just three windows to get there for sure. I think there's a fair bit of chance, a change we still need to do. And I certainly don't think we're in, we are one or two players away from getting us to where I want to be. Nowhere near it. So Phil, so much to break down there, mate. Yeah. Um, and I, like again, go where you want with it. Uh, but also, I do, like he's saying we're we're not one or two players away. But I don't think we're fifteen players away like we were at the start of last summer. So, I mean, where do you land on that? I look. I I think, and when you first asked me the question, I was going to say, look, I'm probably with Andrew on this. I think we probably need, uh, you know, six players, quality, you know, quality Phil, players. Phil. Sorry, mate. Me. Keep talking. I've just got to go out here. Someone's at the yeah, door. Sure. Uh, I'll, I'll be able to hear what you're saying. Just yeah. keep, keep talking. Of course, go for it, mate. I I think we probably are about six players away, personally, um, because if you look at it, 
not we've got to get players and everyone talks about squad squad this squad that we actually players to come in and and absolutely replace some of our first team players because once you start upgrading the first team then the players that are there at the moment go to the bench so for example imagine if you get neto everyone knows i or and if you don't know get to know to quote the great man um if you get someone like neto and kulu drops to the bench and i'm number one in the Kulu Defence League, then you're in a situation where suddenly you've got a player of Kulu's level on the bench, right? How much of a step forward is that from the bench that we've got at the moment, the bench that we had last season? Phenomenal, right? And if you keep doing that in certain key elements of the pitch, suddenly you're at the races. But I think what you've got to look at is how Man City went about their business. They've always bought quality. They've always bought technically amazing players. But a lot of those players, you know, it's only really Grealish and Haaland um, that were like an big money. And uh, I know Haaland wasn't technically big money, but if it wasn't for his buyout clause, he would have been a barnstorming yeah. signing. Everyone wanted him, right? Everyone wanted Record him. Record signing, probably. Yeah. Exactly. But apart from those two, all of those players, on a financial basis at least, were gettable. Of course, yeah. majority of them weren't going to come to Spurs. Now, you know, I know Diaz, we were in four and, you know, another hard luck story, slide indoors moment, stack them up with your vintage collection Spurs. But what you've got to do is keep building competent, technical, great ability players. And all of a sudden you look around and you think, actually, we can compete, right? Because that's what you've got to keep doing. So personally, I would say, uh, I would say six. Six players. For me, but it might not. Even if, as I say, even if we got two quality, right? If we did get, say, Neto and Eze, or Neto and Alize, or something, then all of a sudden you've got players like Johnson and Kulu on the bench, as I said earlier. You know, yep. so all all of a sudden you've got a massive sea change. Imagine if we did go and get, you know, whoever you, you know, any of the tiny number of. Uh, you know, endangered species number nines that we can find. Say we went out and got Vlahovic, right? Mm -hmm. Then all of a sudden, Sonny, you know, whisper it quietly, is playing second fiddle at number nine. Suddenly, um, you know, Richie is having to sit on the bench if he's even still there. But that's when you start to churn the squad as well. If Richie's not happy, do one, mate. Off you go. You know, thanks for the memories. Yeah. And, and, you know, a few of us do appreciate where you're coming from. But if we can upgrade and get better, all of a sudden the team is better. Right. But I would, on the 100 million, I think it's a really timely comment. And I know a lot of people, especially in the YouTube community, couldn't probably get to their thumbnail guy quick enough uh, or spat the tea across the room and started hot, you know, hot typing <laughs> on, on Twitter. I can't believe this same old Spurs. Um, yeah. But, uh, but, but listen, actually, I, I genuinely think that we could get there. I think that, that we are. Of course, we will sure. get to I'm going to I'm going to tell you to be sensible now on the financial side because ultimately, if everyone else is suddenly in trouble with FFP and the sustainability rules, do you want do you want to do the same thing? Yeah, hundred percent. No, but right? what, no, but what I'm saying is I want them to. Oh, and we can afford it. But what I'm what I'm saying to you, my my sort of um, thesis on this is, if you're saying Spurs are okay, right? Kings of FFP. Everyone else is in the soup. Mm. Levy isn't going to uh, the leopard isn't going to change his spots anyway. He'll have to be kicking and screaming, brought to the table. But right. even then, is he going to do it if he then thinks, well, hold on, if we spend a hundred million on Vlahovic, you know, oh, we could have bought two fifty millions. And now, ha the only problem I've got with Ange saying this and putting it out there is now this brings up the narrative that. Spurs aren't at the top table or shouldn't be at the top table. Well, we should be blowing everyone else out of the water financially. This is the thing, if, Phil, right? So, so for me, just if you have a quick gand, quick gander, gander, depending where you're from, gander. at the top, the top, you yeah, no, one, no one, no, I don't gander, <laughs> I, I barely gander either. Let's, let's take a quick butchers <laughs> at uh, the, the top transfers in the Premier League history. Only four of them, I think that is one, two, three, four, are over 100 million Jack Grealish, Moises Caicedo, Declan Rice, and Enzo Fernandez. And if you, if you strip it, if you go back down a little bit more and get to the other ones, I'm not entirely sure 
any of them apart from Declan Rice. And it's probably still too early to tell with Declan Rice because ultimately, if you're spending £100 million on a player, it has to be the difference between finishing. If you're already in Champions League without him, it has to be the difference between qualifying for the Champions League and the Premier League and getting to the quarterfinals or whatever you're doing or and winning it. Same with Harry Kane. The only way Bayern Munich will ever be able to justify Harry Kane's transfer as being a success, it doesn't matter how many goals he scores for them, it's whether or not they lift a trophy that they other, otherwise wouldn't win without him. And that is, of course, the Champions League in the case of Bayern Munich. In the case of Arsenal, it's going to be the Premier League or, or, or a Champions League trophy. But if you look down that list, Fernandez. If you're going to call it a flop or not, Fernandez thus far has been a flop. Declan Rice thus far has been hot, right? But it's still very early to tell. Can Same I just, sorry, I, Sean, one because, thing I've got to yeah, say, because yeah, I know Declan to... Rice is getting a, so many flowers he could open like a chain of international florists at the moment. <laughs> but I just want to say, just for clarity, I will never like Declan Rice. And I think <laughs> anyone who, any, look, you can change clubs, you can change wives. Right, you can estrange yourself from your friends and your family. You can ignore your children, but once you've played a competitive international game for a country, you cannot then change your country. That means <laughs> you are Judas, and Ireland will not forget. Your name is Declan. You are Irish. Okay, you're ugly, and if you weren't a footballer, you'd be a virgin. So shut your mouth and sell more desserts. <laughs> You scumbag. You've gone to the scum and you left Ireland. If I ever see you, mate, we're going to have a fucking problem, all right? Nice. Okay. Sorry, nice. On, no, listen. listen okay, well, we'll, he couldn't we'll, be we'll at a better over. club. He could not be at a better club. Yeah. Judas has gone to the Gooners, okay? Deal with it. Okay, he's a well, great listen, player. He might make a difference. But in, in, he's in a great serious player. Match, Sean, I get all the hate for it. I get the hate for the Irish thing. He is a good player, but right now it's too early to tell whether he's hot or not. He's only been there six, seven months. He's had a good start, but 100 million pounds. You want to want to be the best midfielder in Britain if you have 105 million pound tag. This is the problem, though, with the price tags, right? And this is where we as punters get caught up with this, but everyone in the football bubble gets caught up with it. A player cannot control their market value, okay? They can't control how much they sign for. I think it's been a bit of a millstone around Johnson's neck, how much we paid for him, right? Correct. Yep. Hopefully, the analytics department and a bit of input from the big man himself, they looked at his profile and said, yeah, this is the type of player we want. The fact that it cost us as much money as it did yeah. is, a, is a problem for us because we then think, just like we were talking about the value... Expectations, but, yeah, you come with expectations. You know? Exactly. And the thing I think and, I, is, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I, that extends to Tottenham Hotspur fans. You're paying the best, you're paying the most for season ticket prices, you're paying the most to go, and that extends, right? You have expectations around what the club are going to do with the money. And ultimately, the amount of money that the club generates from season ticket prices, which is we're, we're going to move on. No, we're yeah. not moving on to it yet because I, I do I'm, how, how much time do you have, Phil? Yeah, no, I've got time, mate. I've got time. Okay, okay, cool. Then we'll, we'll just keep going. But look, I think we'll come to the expectations because I, I just want to. We'll finish the hundred million pound thing. For me, look the. I just think you can't guarantee. This is the problem this day and age, Sean. Yeah. Even if Spurs were to go out and splash hundred million, even on a quality player, right? Look, how much more quality could we have got in a number ten than uh, Madison? In Madison, right? not much, right? Right. And okay, we got him at a bargain. That is literally one of the best bargains. I think it's up there in terms of value with Vicario. Unbelievable. Yeah. So kudos to Levy and the club for that. It's unreal. But Savar asked this question a lot on his channel. Would Spurs have bought him if he didn't have a year left on his contract and if his team hadn't been relegated? Would we have splashed 80 million on him? No. And that's where we need to get to. We but need we, to but get we to wouldn't have done, but I don't think it's ne I don't believe, Phil, sorry, just to chime in. I don't believe that I think there's a there's a that's causation. I don't think it's correlation, or sorry, correlation yeah, yeah, yeah. or causation. I feel like Tottenham have so much to do. So when, when Ange came in, it was a title shift. We've got a new system, a new philosophy. We're getting rid of the old. We're trying to get rid of the deadwood. We're trying to maximize value for Harry Kane. You're trying to do a thousand things at once. And, to, and I think Tottenham, for what it's worth, Daniel Levy has worked on a, on, a, on a very thin hierarchical structure. He hasn't had enough experts and enough different. He's starting to fix that. Taken him a long time, but he's starting to fix that. Under Paratici's help and with Johan Langer, we're starting to bring new people in that can take the strain. And he's someone that, you know, for want of a better word, is 
um, a little bit clueless in the additional responsibilities of trying to run a multifaceted, multi-billion pound business. I know he's he's built it himself, but as you go up, you have to end up, you have to start to uh, delegate a little bit better. And I don't think he's he learned that lesson until very recently. However, I think that when it comes to the budgets, they are what they are. The club generates what they generate. We'll talk about the season tickets and the match day revenue and how much of a, a drop in the ocean it really is um, in, in, in the overall kind of look. But if Tottenham are trying to create, trying to bring in 20 new players into the squad over three windows, with the with the FFP as it is and with Tottenham's revenue as they are and, and their, their pay structure, all that stuff, you can't, you can't buy a James Madison for 90 million quid and also afford a Raya, which is what everyone wanted, and also afford an Edmund Tapsoba, which is what everyone wanted, and also afford better people. Like, uh, uh, when, you, when you're trying to transition through, tw tr through a, a, an entire squad, essentially, in two years, I think you have to hope that your talent ID and the price you pay on an individual player is up there. And I think Tottenham over the last 24 months have been really, really good with that. But we, you'll, we will get to a point where we don't need to buy nine players. We only need two. And with the revenues of the club as they will be then, they'll, they'll, they're only going to go up. So the revenue of the club will stay competitive and the need for players goes down. Then Tottenham should be able to be in a position where if whoever the next hundred million pound player is in two years time, if Tottenham really need it, but we don't need to buy a midfielder, a six or seven a nine a three, a backup, a goalkeeper, all that stuff. And we're also selling some of our youth, youth players. We're also generating revenue that way. If all of these things come to fruition at the same time, the perfect storm does provide me a vision where I can see Tottenham saying, don't need a lot, but we do need one. And it's big. And you know what? You've got to pay market rates. And that might look like a hundred million. Or it would at least look like a record signing. I think I predict Tottenham will, will, will make a club record signing in the next 24 months. Yeah, but I think almost, Sean, we might be at that stage now. I think the, 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 the amount of churn we made last summer, right? And even um, the little bit of business we did in January, even though, you know, you could argue in a way that's been a bit more underwhelming, especially with the f very few minutes dragger scene scene. Uh, try saying that after a few points. Um, you, you're in a situation where now I think is a time, you know, we don't want to end up, God forbid, in a situation like Chelsea, where it's all talent ID, but you're literally just wait, you know, they're going to have to wait like five years for those players to mature and grow as a team. But in the, in the meantime, football's moved on. Ch like right. Chelsea, I can only imagine Todd or someone in Clear Lake is a massive Spurs fan. And they've got Agent Potch in because I, like you couldn't crash a football club worse than they are at the moment. Like it's unbelievable. So maybe now what we need to do, we've we've done really well. I, I mean, I've never seen right Spurs bring in players of the likes of Vicario, Van der Ven, and okay, Madison was prem proven, but um, obviously Saar had hardly seen any games, and, and obviously that's something we could we could hang around Conte's neck as well. Um, but Adogi, obviously, Premier League starter this year. They've all come in and they've all hit the ground running and all made an impact. And now mm -hmm. they're mainstays in the team. You can't see them being dropped ever. And and, you, and their market values skyrocketed. But actually, now I think we might already be at a stage where we keep trying to find those gems using, you know, um, Moneyball type scenarios and the data to pick out the gems. But maybe also say we need some of the players at the very top of these statistical analysis throughout yeah. the game to actually say, right, now is the time where... But that's perfect, if, though. Is, is, if they do you want 75 for Eze, let's pay 75 for Eze. If but they do you, want... but you can you see that that coming to play? First of all, you've got the, the, the hopefully deflationary aspect of FFP that takes a little bit of the air out of the balloon. So the top value comes down a little bit. I don't know if Kylian Mbappe is going to create that that, that kind of knock-on domino effect where the money keeps moving around. But I would imagine that there's going to be some opportunities that present itself to those that can afford it this summer and going into the the, the even stricter rules, by the way. FFP, the PSR rules are for UEFA's perspective, get tighter next year. It goes from 80% to 70% of your net, of your total revenues that you can spend. So there's more pressure on ways to find um, efficiencies. And I think that Tottenham, well, me, if, if Tottenham needs fewer and fewer big players. Yeah. I want to ask you a question. 
with what you've just said about the the spending within UEFA rules being tighter there even than the Prem, could you envision a situation where Spurs absolutely need to, and I think that's why tomorrow is so important, we need to qualify for the Champions League because I can envisage a situation where so many teams can't actually take part in the Champions League next year that we might only need to beat two teams to win the thing. (laughs) Well, listen, Uh, it, it it didn't pan out in any way that it was meaningful in the end, but there was a conversation about Chelsea. Like, yeah, of if, they, course. if they were to qualify for the Conference League via the Carabao they Cup, would they turn they, it down? They, because they couldn't have taken part. They couldn't have taken Listen, part, right? Actually, Sean, one thing, right, to loop all the way back to something we were talking about probably 50 minutes ago, the yeah. only thing I would say um, about Spurs and not winning things in Levy's tenure, but even if you wind the clock back, because let's let's not forget, um, come the end of this season, it's the 40th anniversary of us winning um, a major European trophy, as you can see here. Look at that. Look at that thing nice. of beauty. Nice. Um, but in the end, it's that's 40 years ago. All the players that played that day are old men, right? And some of, <laughs> some of us are old men as well. Um, but I think if you look at how many semi-finals and finals we've been in, in Levy's era and in Sugar's era, um, and even, to be fair, you know, we lost our first FA Cup final in 87, and obviously we've won, we've lost, sorry, with a record amount of semi-finals in the FA Cup. I think being that close to being able to win things, we should have been able to get, get over the line in that period. And now, and that's where this whole Spursy thing comes from, and I think that is part of the thing that we need to change. And I think Levy needs to think seriously about what he can do to change that. Now, obviously, player recruitment, as we're on the subject of it now, is the key um, thing, the key measurable, and the key thing that he, hands-on, can change. But the more ethereal thing that he needs to be mindful of, and I think a a man like Ange and how he's coming across, hopefully, is a big part of this, I think we almost have to have that change of culture, both in the dressing room, on the terraces. You know, we need to forget about being Spursy and we need to look at the... Why do Liverpool win so much? It isn't just... It's it's the heritage of the club, but they almost, they almost think we are going to win because we've won so much before, right? And that right. was Spurs in the Cups up until, I would say, 87 and maybe the last dead cat bounce in 91, Right. We need to get back to that space where even if we're not competing in the league, which we all want to, we do need to be competitive in anything we're doing. And people need to see that Spurs mean business, right? Forget what's happened over the last 20 years. Forget what's happened over the last 30, 40 years. We need to create this new spirit and do everything better. And actually, that is something that I do when we come on to ticketing. I think that's something else we need to think about because every single aspect of the football club and as a business, as a, as a football endeavour, we all, as fans as well, we all need to be thinking every waking moment and dreaming of it while we're asleep. How can Spurs do things out of the box? How can we be better? And actually, when it comes to spending, um, because if you're a top player in Europe, if it's us versus another top side, you'd probably pick the other top side. Now we've started to see some players picking us because of the project, because of the story that they're being told. We need to capitalise on that and really drive it home. But we need to live and breathe this. Spurs need to be... Spurs can't make any mistakes, right? Every signing we need to make is top. Every... Everything right. we do in the club needs to be top. And that's why I'm so disappointed with Levy over the ticketing thing because I don't think it is the right decision. Well, because we will talk about that. a wedge between the club and the fans. Well, we actually all need to bond together, which is something that has changed in the last eight months. Let's talk about that right now. Um, just quickly, uh, guys, if you're listening on Instagram, if you're watching on Instagram, we're at, I think, I don't even know if it will still be uh, viable because of, uh, I think I might have already been cut off. But if I haven't, Guys, if you are on Instagram and you're watching this, then shout out to you. It's a debut test on it. We're going to end the live video there, but come over to the YouTube channel, Spurs Talk Show on YouTube, and you can watch the the bit now, which is, I guess, why we were we were here in the first place. We spent an hour and 15 minutes talking about other things, but now we're going to get onto the nitty-gritty. So I'm going to end the stream on Instagram. Thanks if you've been participating over there. Come over to the, uh, to the YouTube channel. All right, that's that done. 
That was interesting. I'll go back and watch it, see if that worked later on. Um, we've got a super chat from Tiff and Toe, Tiff and uh, Ta Tejo, Tiff Andy Tejo. I'm not sure I'm saying that correctly, <laughs> but big up to you, Tiff. Uh, really appreciate it, mate. For all the know it alls that say we won't win the Champions League or Premier League because Levy won't spend a hundred million on a player, explain how Liverpool has done it multiple times. Sometimes I can't stand some Spurs fans. Listen, um, Tiff Andy Tejo, I think there's a lot of people, a lot of Tottenham fans. Who, uh, who, who can't stand a lot of Tottenham fans generally? I think that that's just part, part and parcel of being a fan of a division. Like it's, it's kind of there's always going to be sort of uh, to and fro, right? If we all want the best for Tottenham. We've all just got our own version of what that looks like and how we can get there. And this is what we're here yeah, to discuss. Gone. Don't don't forget, a lot of us Levy outers don't want to see the club do well because we want to be proved right. Okay, just remember that. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, I know you. I know you're saying that in jest. But part of me thinks there's an element of that to a degree look, sometimes. Look, don't get me know? wrong. No, but there, look, there's always one, isn't there? There's always one at a party. There'll, or, there'll be someone who would rather we don't do something just so I, I was right all along. I told right. you. You know, there's always that, right? There's always that. But this is, this, and we will get on to the ticking thing, but this is what pisses me off so much. I want Levy to prove me wrong. Don't act like an arsehole, you know? Don't rip off the old people. And like, well, let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. I just want to say on Tiff's point, and this is what just Angie's point about the 100 million is fascinating because I'm, I'm sure didn't Jürgen in his ultimate wisdom, obviously, because he knows everything and it's the best. Um, uh, he was so good, he even had his teeth fixed. Didn't he once say he was lambasting another club, maybe City, for spending, you know, they spend over a mi 100 million on Grealish, I think it was. Yeah. And then they bid over 100 for uh, Casado. Yeah. So I think just the way, look, and inflation, which, you know, buzzword, if you play in the uh, Sean Butler TV drinking game, inflation, inflation, <laughs> inflation. That's six <laughs> fingers of beer you've got to drink, boys and girls. Um, <laughs> but you've, uh, <laughs> but look, you, in the end of the day, football finances will catch up. And look, the other thing I would say, Levy, I bet, couldn't believe it. You know, he finally got a bit more punching power. We're back in a new stadium. We've made it that far in a Champions League all the way to the final, fell at last hurdle, famously. And he mm. thinks, right, now's the time I can go and lash out whatever we said we'd pay for for GLC and and Don Blay, you know, meant to be game-changing signings. Didn't work out, obviously, as we know. Um, so that whole period was pretty much uh, a letdown. But... By the time we were spending 60, 65 million on a player, you know, spending and then pass that by, that was all of a sudden just also ran footballers were going for 65 million quid. Yeah. You know, well, that's where we're at 60, now, though. Well, that's where we have been. Million. Now. I mean, all that you get is a bum from Chelsea. Do you know what yeah. I mean? It's ridiculous. The peak in the peak in valuations for average players, I think, happened in 2020, just before COVID. Since then, I think obviously you've got COVID, the implications, the ramifications of that. You've got you've got the, the P PSR, the FFP. It's all coming to a head. Like I say, I personally it's believe been that an element of it, though, Sean. I think you know th uh, what's that expression? History doesn't repeat itself; it rhymes. There's yeah. always been an element of this. Oh, he's played for this club, so he must be a good player. We buy him. Oh, Chelsea, no, Chelsea have got Chelsea have got an incredible track record of retaining value in their players. Because you know what is brilliant about them is that they, and they allow this narrative to to uh, to like to froth because it helps them. It's oh, it's not the player that's turned bad; it's just playing in the Chelsea system. So you know, when they buy a player, it doesn't work out. They can generally sell the player for as much money as they paid for him because it's not Chelsea. It's not the player that's turned terrible. It's uh, it's 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 the Chelsea model, which is why they could get top money for my for Mason Mount, top money for Kai Havertz both of whom haven't done anything particularly meaningful at their new clubs. Yeah, but Shai Havertz apparently is balling out at Arsenal, mate. He's the reason why they're going to win the Prem. So, you know, yeah. just get on that train, Sean. Don't you see? If you can't see, if you can't see what... <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, uh, if you can't see what um, Captain Black is doing at the Emirates, mate, you need to piss off down the White Hart Lane. Piss off down White Hart Lane. Well, look, I'd like to piss off down the White Hart Lane, but it's going to cost me 6% more than yeah. it would have done last season as a season ticket holder. I had this conversation with, when the news first broke, we had Johnny on and uh, Guy Masterson, who made his debut on the channel. And I, what I, I debut? It was a brilliant debut from him. It was absolutely that sensational. guy's dulcet tones. I mean, Jesus, he was... Uh... Yeah. 
Tom no. Jones, isn't it? He's, he's a Welsh boy. He's very I, posh and he's very... I, uh, mate, I don't think he can leave the house. I don't think his missus lets him leave the house because if he starts no, talking... scary. Yeah, under, people... Under, underwear's hitting need. the deck, mate. Every, underwear's hitting the deck. 100%. Uh, look, he did it, made a brilliant debut and I gave him... I didn't know what his take was on Daniel Lee, but I didn't know what his take was on this. And he was someone that's approaching the uh, the concession age. Um so we got, you know, I went through it with him and Johnny played the kind of the Levy outside of the narrative. I, I obviously played the business side and, and and he actually ended up playing the balance in between. But look, there's a thousand different ways to approach this. And Phil, I haven't heard yours, but I know you reached out to me and said that you're incredibly passionate about this topic. Yeah. So I'd love to give you the floor and and let, let you explain to the 500 people that are watching across all socials. By the way, guys, hit the likes, hit the subscribe and all that stuff. Um Tell us why it's abhorrent and why Daniel Levy is um, he's gone back to a villain status for for what he's done. Look, I just think there's there's obviously ways of justifying this, right? You know, inflation. Uh, there you go, drinking game. Another two fingers, everyone. Um, you can look at it and say he's only put the ticket prices up once since we moved into the new stadium. You know, all these things you know, Liz Truss, you know, whatever you want to blame it on. Um, the world's a different place. You look in the shops now, everything's costing more. We are already paying, if not up there with, if not the most expensive, up there with the most expensive um, ticket pricing to watch association football anywhere in the universe, right? That's that's where we are uh, at the moment. And well, I mean, it's, Fulham, Fulham's top tier is more expensive than Tottenham's. Arsenal's no, is comfortable. Mate, that's why I didn't say we were the top. I said we were near the top. Near the top. Yeah, okay. We're in, yeah. Okay. We're in the top three or four, aren't we? Yeah. You know, and, we do, and we do. And we do. And we do provide the probably the most, the most um, top end experience in order to which of which to consume the football that, that's on offer. Sure. But to be fair, Sean, right? The most top end experience that I'm interested in is what's happening on the pitch. Right. Right. I would, and I'm sure crackers, I think uh, from last word on Spurs and, and other uh, outlets, I'm sure he summed it up best for me when he said, you know, if the new stadium's wonderful, I love the new stadium. I'm not anti the new stadium. I think it's amazing. I do think stadiums and stands and everything are really important parts of football culture. And I think anyone who doesn't understand that, really maybe doesn't understand football culture as, as well as they might think they do. You know, the cop, how synonymous that is with with Anfield and with Liverpool's storied history. The shelf for Spurs, you know, all the different stands, are, every club has it, their hotbed of uh, their fan base and where, you know, the passion has come from for years and years and years. And hopefully, you know, the Park Lane is going to be that for for generations to come for Spurs. I, look, I think the new stadium is is brilliant. I I won't hear, hear a word said against it, except the fact that you could probably bend metal with the temperature under the taps. And I don't know. I thought you had a, I thought, I thought had a, a, a spoke sponsorship. There's no soap in those toilets, Sean. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Molten Bradley. So is it, is it Molten, Molten Brown or whatever it's called? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Molten Brown, texture like sun. They need yeah. to get in there, mate. Never mind giving us some money. Give us some supplies, lads. Yeah. Jesus Do you know Christ. what? I was having this conversation last night, not to get off the topic, but I was having this conversation last night because I'm always an advocate on here for efficiencies. And the amount of times I have conversations with people at the stadium around how Bro. Tottenham could be making more money. I, just mate, quickly, I, just super quickly, I think that the fact that you can't get a beer with, inside of three minutes of wanting one in the, in the world's largest single bar, I think it's a disgrace. The fact that you have to leave your state, your seat before the end of the first half, and you're still not guaranteed to get back for the start of the second half to get a beer or a burger or whatever you want, I think is a disgrace. And I think that Daniel Levy and it's the efficiencies crazy. crew, the people that are efficient, the operations and efficiencies crew, need to look at uh, certain ways to do it. Now, one of the obvious way is to have installed more pumps and to have to, to hire a few new people that are on ten pound an hour. And if you're selling. You know, for each person that's there to, to hand them over and do the do the, the till system, if you're selling 15 more pints an hour, you do a 5x on the, the additional cost, and there's more more and more, more and more money. But you know what? They pump, they put, they installed what they installed, they've hired what they've hired, and it is what it is. But here's another way that they could do it: hire a third party. If you ever go to a, a stadium in America, there's people that have got like rocket packs on their back with yeah, full yeah. up with beer, and they just like. They just shoot guns into glasses. 
it's all over America. They could hire a, a team to come into the South Stand and not. So you haven't got to stand by the bar. They can just walk around and take payment on a on a whatever some implant on your wrist or whatever, and then and then just shoot people's fill people's beer up. You could they could make so much more money sure. if the access sure. to concept the access to the uh, to the the thirsty people. Listen, um, so I will tell you was, was an easy way of skyrocketing the amount of beer they sell without doing another thing except for, a, a, you know, getting a few joiners in and, and getting a bit of, uh, getting a few things more built. Pumps, so, more pumps in, right? Well, no, all they need to do, what do you do with, I know, you know, I know uh, you try and be like an undercover homeless bloke, do you know what I mean? Walking a dog and trying to get a few quid on YouTube. Yeah. But um, I want to say this, if you ever got out like that. Don't it's call me out for that. Mate, <laughs> respect the underclass, Sean. Respect the underclass. You know, I've got a lot of time for the homeless. And, it, you know, if, they are, and if they've if they got a dog, I'm going to give them money. But the dogs aren't hungry, mate. That's all I'm saying. Um, listen, big up Bugsy. That was a if joke, you, Robert. It was a joke, mate. Don't take me too seriously. Yeah, oh. Listen, I want to <laughs> say one thing. If you go to the theatre in the West End or probably anywhere on planet Earth, definitely in the UK, what you do, you buy drinks for half time. OK, this yeah. could very easily be done on an app very easily, very quickly. Or if not, just do it, you know, face to face with bar staff. All they need to um, look and don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm a football fan. I know what will go on. If you've got beers sat on one side with, you know, Phil P written on it, someone's just going to come along and, uh, you know, canvas that. That's what I mean, but you can just hire people to come in with well, those cameras. Have, have lockers, have lockers and you could have a code. Once you've bought there the you beers, go. you're given a code. You go to where you think it's going to be. You're given the exact location, and you just yep. open it. It's Any at the three back. Word. It's yep. at the back. Yeah, you tap it in, and you open it up. You've got your four points for you and your mates. Job done. Listen, I agree. I agree. There's a there's a million Job ways done. to add efficiencies, right? For for your method, for people just walking around like they do hot dogs. Get your hot dogs here, but it's beer instead. Yep. All that sort of thing. There's a million ways to do it, and it all it increases the revenues. I think I think there's an efficiency Listen, problem at the stadium. Or, much, sure. much more important, I would say, than the ticket price rises. Look, for me, I just think, look, don't get me wrong. I'm not, sh you know, I work in finance. I'm not stupid. I know that these ticket prices aren't going to stay where they are now forever, okay? One, but, one, one price rise in the last five years since we moved to the new stadium of 1.5%. And then it's so now the 6% makes it, you know, aggregated at 7.5% over five years, 1.5% per year. The cost of putting on an event has gone up by a far like the individual specific unit costs of it, of all the different things has far higher numbers uh, than 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 traditional measured RPI and CPI. So for Tottenham Hotspur, it's at margin erosion at every single cost. Unless you pass those costs on, you understand finance. I know you do. I understand finance. We understand business. It has you have to pass the costs on. Six percent, I don't think well, is that I'm, unreasonable. I was expecting a lot more. Yeah, look, mate, this is the thing. Anyone who's surprised or shocked by it hasn't been paying attention. This should have happened last year, right? We've got an extra year out of it. This would have happened last year, but if you want and nobody, nobody was nobody gave year, Daniel Levy any flowers last year. All they did was pivot yeah, but, their attention yeah. to the to the increase in the in the non-season yeah, ticket prices. Yeah, but Sean, that was because, right? And I know you've accused a few of us of talking our own book because it is affecting us now but i was massively against that because and even though it only affected a very small proportion because there's only probably what six seven thousand non-season ticket fans that get to go every game in the end everyone did it because everyone knew this was coming if he could have got away with doing it last year he would have done it and this is what i think the problem is sean and why i think it's so abhorrent to me it's justifiable on all the bases you've said. I can't argue with what you've said. What I'm arguing is it shouldn't be done. It can be done. He is doing it. Will we lump it? Yes, we will. I would like nothing more than to film a video, maybe here on your channel, of me setting a light to a season ticket. But I haven't got one. It's on my fucking phone. OK, when I book a ticket for a cup game, I'm paying an admin fee. Levy, you should be paying me, mate. I'm the one doing the admin. How about it's 50 quid a ticket? Make it 49. Because, I, you know, give me a quid for admin. I'm the one doing the typing. There isn't even Lewis in the ticket office who's having to sell it to me. I'm doing it myself. But that, but that, that again, I'm you only make it come yeah, but, but all, those, all those little things are little ways in which you disguise the price rises, right? 
Yeah, but listen, mate, th this all falls into something, right? He's, you can applaud him for the business acumen. You can do every, look, all the things that we will congratulate him on, fine. But with no, but this, we don't do it, do we? The, the Levy Out crew do not congratulate him. They, they, they'll pay lip service in a debate, in an oh, argument. Right. The, the Levy Out crew will say, no, look, yeah, on all the business stuff, he's great. He's great. I've said that. Box tick. Now let's focus on all the things why I hate him. Right? And I get it. I get it. It's a movement. I understand that. But well, like when they say, I'll, I'll give him I'll give him his flowers when it's due, it's, there's very little conversation from those people that goes anything further than just, yeah, he's a good businessman. Well done. But when it came to last season, season ticket holders who got a, who got a price freeze Listen, were, were, okay. were furious I, 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 about things that didn't affect them, which was the price rises in, in one hotspot membership. I and that, where, where I would like to go with, it, with those people, because we knew that it was coming for us as well. But you're fighting the fire. You're fighting the fire for people that that, that are not yourself, which I admire. Right? It's a nice. It's a nice. It's a nice kind of a element of virtue signaling. But the the reality is. That, that you could, you know, we could fill that stadium for uh, Phil. And let me ask you this I, you, you've yeah. got kids, right? How, how many season tickets do you own? Uh, four and four. my dad, and then my dad's on top of that as well. So, is part of the frustration for you the fact that the cost of taking your entire family to Tottenham is so expensive? Yes, and no, because look, mate, I, I say this all the time, I say this to my kids. I count myself as extremely lucky in life and, and generally because, you know, I've got a roof over my head. I've got a job uh, that pays well. I've, you know, I've obviously got some okay friends. Um, I'm relatively, <laughs> I'm relatively attractive. I've still got my health and I support yeah. one of the greatest football teams in the history of association football. And I get to go to White Hart Lane for most home games. It, right. and, and it's been a dream of mine to be a season ticket holder for pretty much all my life. And now mm -hmm. I am. And I'm extremely grateful for that. And I know, look, I don't know. What, but what you're not entitled saying. to that. You're not entitled to any of those no, things. Right? Of course you've got, mate, listen, um, unfortunately, and, and this is where the rubber meets the road. Life isn't fair. Life will punch you hard in the face. 100%. Quote there's some people that turn right. left when they get on planes, and there's some people that turn right. But, there's some but, people that have to yeah. shop in Audi. There's some people that have to go to food banks. There's some people that can shop at Harrods. But, but like, sure, it's not, it's not fair. Is, we'd, yeah, but the thing I would say is, you, we and it, it's not, unfortunately, life isn't like this either. Those of us that are doing well, we do need to look and see, you know, I, I you know, I, I'm from a working class background. I've had to graph for everything I've achieved in my life. And, you know, my dad's an immigrant. He came to this country and he saw a team playing it all in white. And he thought that looks amazing. And then he, yeah. he has been a Spurs fan ever since. And he's responsible. For, I think we stopped counting at 27. He took 27 people to their first Spurs game. OK, including myself. So and, and look, you're talking about season tickets. There's, uh, we've got five season tickets in our family because of my dad, but me right. and my two kids, my brother and his four kids, um, my other nephew, and then pretty much half my 26 cousins are all Spurs because of my dad. He's taken 27 people to their first Spurs games. Okay. Right. That's a proper legacy. Now he's got to the stage and I'm very, I am grateful because I thought when we were going back to White Hart Lane, okay, from Wembley, where I first heard a season ticket, had a season ticket, I thought that there wasn't going to be any concessions. Because if you remember remember back to the old White Hart Lane, it was only really, and, you know, don't quote me on this, I'm sure people in the chat will know this better than me. I think you're in a situation where there was only the family enclosure and certain elements, maybe the Paxton, where you got concessions at all. If you ever, as members, and as I was, we got tickets anywhere else. My dad was yeah. paying full whack. The kids were paying full whack. So yeah. I was bracing myself that Levy was going to take this opportunity to smash us all over the head financially and nick the wallet as we came back through the door. And we were all going to be paying a grand for each season ticket. So the fact that we got concessions, I was very grateful for. And I think it's a great move. But this is the point, Sean. If it was a good idea then, it's still a good idea now. Well, no, but here's, here's the difference. Here's the difference, especially with the senior citizens thing. And look, I, like I say, 
people people will always hate me for for taking the other side of the argument. The show is called On the Other Hand. It's also the same with same with the Devil's Advocate. I think obviously people who know me know that I lean into a certain start, a certain I'm capitalist at heart. I think that you know, work hard, play hard, earn it if if you can, whatever else. But I also I also am only taking the other side of this argument for the purposes of balance to a degree. I think that in an ideal world, if people are you know, enable, uh, unable, incapable of affording it, then you find ways to help to help. However, you also have to take note of the fact that there is a massively short supply and a significantly higher, significantly higher demand for tickets. Daniel Levy's working with a product, not because of loyalty of fans, but because the product is desirable that of it's inelastic demand. He could re he could double the season tickets and people would still buy them. And then the argument he doesn't double them. He doesn't double them. And this notion, by the way, I saw a lot of this being pointed out on uh, on Twitter the other day. Former Bayern club Yuli Honus, you know, talking yeah, yeah. about the way that he but approached this is ten years team. old. Yeah, yeah. But this is 2014, right? When the price was 104 pound. That was 2014-15 season. The average price of a Bayern, or the, the Bayern Munich season tickets now range from 500 to 750 pound. So he's put the price much up sevenfold since then. Still much right? cheaper than ours. Still a lot cheaper, but he's put the price up sevenfold since then. Tottenham haven't done that. And so you have to kind of you're move. Calling out, you're calling him out. You're calling him out. I'm going to call, call out, gonna call out the hypocrisy. Right? The starting point was cheap, but it's, get, it's closing the gap. My point is that at the end of the day, with respect to anyone who has children, who want to have a child's season ticket, you are taking that that seat does not is not yours. You, your 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 loyalty as a season ticket holder offers you the chance to renew your season ticket. You don't have to go back to the back of the waiting list, but there is a never ending stream of people that will take your ticket and would pay full price if they could be if they're an adult. And I think that when you look at just one second, I think if you're baking in the other reality of the demographics in society, that at the moment, if you Make the assumption that the average demographic at Tottenham reflects something like the average demographic in the UK. Then, in the next five to ten years, sixty-five percent of the entire stadium would be filled with people that are in the are senior citizens. In the UK, two thirds of the population will be supported by one third in the next ten years because of the aging population crisis. If Tottenham Hotspur were to continue to allow everybody that is a season ticket holder, in the second that they move into the senior citizen category, they get a fifty percent discount. Then two thirds of the stadium will be filled with fifty percent discounts. And as a business, Daniel Levy will pass that cost on in some form or fashion. And how's that going to look? It's going to look just like it is in the real world. Me and you, as a tax-paying member of the public, Phil, are going to get very little, and we're going to pay a lot more for it in the form of taxes. And paying your season ticket is some form of tax to watch your Tottenham Hotspur, your beloved Tottenham Hotspur. So I think that when you look at Tottenham and you look at Arsenal, both clubs have made the decision to scale back on the access. I get it. In an ideal world, it's not fair. In an ideal world, everyone should have everything for free, and then we can watch the best team to be hyperbolic, but everyone should be able to access it at reasonable rates. But the reality is that not everybody can. We're complaining about the price of a season ticket, but there's 80,000 people that would do anything to get a season ticket, but they can't get it because me and you are keeping them from having it. So why are we entitled to moan about the price? Then someone else will be happily happy, will happily pay, but has to wait for their access until me or you give it up. We are stopping them from watching Tottenham. Why is that okay? But also, we demand that Daniel Levy keeps the price affordable for us when they would be happy to pay more. Square so, that circle. Sean, let me ask you something, if I can. You don't need to be exact with this, but just give me a ballpark if you're comfortable with answer, an, answering this question. When you got your season ticket, where were you in the season ticket waiting list? What sort of approximate number? Were I don't you? know, like 50,000, I think I got offered it. But yeah. I, was, I was a single guy, solo guy, so I, I wasn't... Yeah, so you could take I, one on your own. Yeah. I, a friend of mine, Naz, who used to come sometimes when the kids couldn't to midweek games. Shout out, Naz. Um, top man. He's now in the West Upper. God knows how he's going to afford the increase. Yeah. <laughs> so good luck, Naz. Um, he might be starting a YouTube channel as well just to pay for it. Um, <laughs> he, um, 
He'll be saying, sorry, Naz Junior, we've got to go and watch the we've got to go and watch the youth team up Boreham Wood play Arsenal free because we can't afford the team tickets anymore. Um <laughs> Listen, I'm g- listen, you go with him, Phil, man. Phil, sure, Phil, Phil. sure, I'd, sure, I'd, I'd I'm like going to take it at football. I really listen. want you to ask, answer that question for me, right? Because I'm, I'm I, I think it's an important point. point. I think it's an important point. We have season tickets. We have the My access to renewing them. Season. Yeah, yeah. But that Why is it okay for sure. us? Why is it okay yeah, for course. us to stop and prevent other people that are waiting in line and also moan about the price to do so? Okay, but that... I think almost is it's one of the great British traditions is queuing. Okay, right. we were just further. Ahead. Oh, it, look, I, don't get me, don't get this twisted. I am just very lucky that I was on the waiting list before you and before the bloke who would pay two thousand pounds for my one thousand currently one or ish one thousand pound season ticket. Right, right, it, yeah. And look, and that is supply and demand. Just because someone else would be willing to pay more than I'm paying for it doesn't mean that what I'm paying for it is is wrong, right? I feel desperately sorry. I wish there was a 200,000 seat uh, stadium for Spurs, but there isn't. We have got what we have got. That right. is a shame, right? Yeah. But yeah. my point to this is, if you're following the tax analogy, we're all, you know, we're all citizens of the land of Tottenham. What a lovely country it is. But what Levy has done with all the other revenue streams, and this isn't just me giving him his flowers because it's a Levy out box tick that we've got to do to seem reasonable. So I don't care about seeming reasonable. I am reasonable. (laughs) I'm telling you, Levy has struck oil in the North Sea with all these other things. So basically what he could do if he wants to win this election of public popular opinion in Levy land, uh, yeah. A little but North London borough of Tottenham Hotspur as a country, he could turn around just before the election, Sean, and give a tax break. He could reduce taxes. Why would he? Taxpayers. And and how if how would that make the people election. feel? Yeah, but the people that are waiting in the queue. Yeah. Do you but not sure. think that like it, are, are they well, angry or are they you're, sad? You're are they are they happy? Are they happy? Hang on, hang on. Let, let me let me let me ask a question. Are the people that are eighty thousand? I won't let you finish unless you say the word land. If you say let me land, I'll let you land. But I'm not. Let me land. Let me land. Okay. Let me land. If the people that are waiting in the queue, right, yeah. that can afford that can afford the season ticket, and unfortunately, like I say, there's people that turn left and people that turn right. It is what it is. But and. This idea, by the way, that you're pricing out real fans, this notion that because you're poor or poorer yeah. or have less money than someone who has more money or is wealthier or rich, because that is a reality, that means that you're more of a fan and wealthier people are not, is an absolute misnomer. It's, a, it's actually offensive to people that have done well but are still a passionate fan. There's a guy called Danny um, Spurs Irk who's on Twitter. He's... Uh, been a season ticket holder at Tottenham all his life. He's, I don't know how old he is, 55 or something. He's in the tunnel club. He took, he was very gracious, took me to the tunnel club. That guy travels overseas every game. He goes home away, season ticket. He's, he grew up being a Tottenham thug, whatever, like a, you know, he was a kid. He was out there with like messing around, all that stuff. And he's more passionate about Tottenham than, than, than most people. But because he's done very well for himself, he happens to go to that the tunnel club. He wants to experience a nicer way. I went in there. Every other person that's in there is the same. Super passionate. Just happen to have done well for themselves. This notion that rich aren't real fans and poor people are is bullshit. Yeah, Sean, that, that, that's not the argument I would make, though. I think the differential in pricing is the future. The fact there is a tunnel club, the fact that Johnny, you know, one of our own, um, you know, pays the prices that he pays. You know, he had that debenture that he talks about. In the end, you know, it's phenomenal that fans can afford and want to have that different experience. And it's one of the fantastic things about the new stadium, that there is this differentiation and you can pay more. My point is, just because fans can pay that and want to pay and want that different experience, don't raise the bar of having to pay for all fans, and I look, and I think there is again. I'll go back to the same point, mate. Devil's advocate. Yeah, I want to sit. If I'm, fly, if I'm flying to Australia, on the other hand, if I'm flying to Australia tomorrow yeah. for a holiday, I'm turning right 
because I can't afford the amount of money it's going to cost to yeah, sit yeah. on the left on the left hand side of the, the front end of the plane. Right? To the people on the front, to, to the people that can afford the top end of the plane, the plane give a give a shit about me. They don't. Right? You have to. You have to. Like it is what it is. And for me, this notion that I still don't think has been answered. If the price rises, allow a few people to drop off and allow a few more people off that waiting list to get access to their to their ability to support the club week in, week out. Where's the sympathy for them that is priced out by an artificially suppressed season ticket price that just maintains and continues the loyalty of people who have the option to be loyal anyway? They get first dibs on the season ticket. If you don't want it, there's a lot of people that do, and they're just as big fans. They're waiting patiently for their chance. And unfortunately, market forces prevail. I haven't heard a compelling argument for why in any other walk of life, businesses, you know, Apple doesn't, Apple's got brand loyalty. Apple don't say, well, you know what? I'm going to give, you've been a fan of, you've been a long-term customer of Apple. I'm going to give you your, your phone at 50% of the price. It doesn't work anywhere yeah, else. Yeah, but this sure. notion that it's a fan, not a customer is bollocks as well. You're both. Two things can be true yeah, at the same I'll, time. Yeah, they can both be true at the same time, Sean. But there's a reason why it's called the jet set, right, back in the day. Flying's a much more affordable thing now than it was in the past. Maybe not so much these days. But you literally had to be rich or famous to get on any sort of plane when it first became popular in the 60s. You know, and so it is different. Sean, this used to be a working class game. And I'm might be tall you know this might be nostalgia glasses and looking back to a, a you know a something that's long been dead but whether it's whether it's the fact that we're paying so much money to come and watch association football or whether it's the fact that there's VAR or whether it's the fact that oil states own football clubs and sports washing and all these things the game has been changed so far from where it began it's a rich man's plaything not just the owners of it now Basically, you've got to be well healed to get into the stands now, and that that isn't the game that any of us fell in love with, right? What, what, are, they, what are they supposed to do, mate? Give me a solution that considers the fans that are in the stadium, but that also considers the hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people that are desperate to get in. Explain to me a solution where everybody is happy. There. I don't think there is one, but I'd love to hear one. I'd love to hear, I'd love to hear an, an, an answer for it. Yeah, but Sean, with what you're saying then is, if you if you look at that then, and if it was purely done as a from a business model, supply and demand, then why isn't every season ticket ten grand then? Because there'll be enough people in the Spurs fan base that could afford it. Why? Why not then? Why not just follow it it's, to the it's, end? It's, it's, a, it's, a method, it's, a, it's a political method called logical incrementalism. Right, you 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 push the needle a little bit, you push it too far, yep. and you get a little bit, you get an overreaction or a reaction, people. Then you dial back a little bit, and everyone calms down, and then you push the push the needle. Yeah. It's just and a, that's it's exactly a, but that it, is exactly what's happened. If you look at what's happening with the season ticket pricing, what's happening with a pint of beer and the you know the dreaded sausage rolls in the stadium, it's all the same thing. Anyone who's watched a wire will know this. You sell, you create demand at a cheaper level or give the drugs away. And all of a sudden, everyone's used to it. No one's drinking in the pub or not as many people drink in the pubs around Tottenham. But, but the pubs around Tottenham are just as expensive, if not more expensive than the pubs. They are more expensive, Sean. But that's at first that, you know, you could get Heineken for four quid when we first moved in. It's not four quid anymore. And I know right. that's because in, in the stadium. It was four. No, but quid. I'm saying this, the, pri the price of a pint in the stadium now is seven, yeah. six fifty, whatever it is. My, my you go, you is, go to the number eight bar. You go to the, the any of the other pubs around. They're all the same. It's all the same. You're not getting a cheaper pint anywhere else anymore. Yeah, but what, that's the point I'm making, Sean. He 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 wanted people to come to the stadium. Okay, so we all went to the stadium. Well, not all of us, but a lot of people went to the stadium, and it sucked a lot of the business from the local pubs into the stadium. But over the last few years, the prices of the beers has gone up exponentially, and out to, ma to match the price of a pint in the pub outside the stadium. But that, my point to that is though, this is and, and look, I've got no problem with that, right? Because people can choose to drink. I don't, exactly, I don't. I don't understand what the, I, the, 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 explain to me the notion of why a pub, a pint, a price of the pint inside the stadium should be cheaper than the price of the pint outside the stadium. 
Well, it, it, exactly. If anything, it's by raising the prices, why, you're why, helping why, out the local why, community, aren't you? Why? Exactly. But why did, in that circumstance, and why did Levy price it competitively when we first came in? It was to encourage people to come in, wasn't it? It was to I don't, create... I, I, don't, I don't remember that specific scenario, to be honest. I don't remember if, if they were, did it at 50% discounts or whatever, but... Well, no, if that was just it, where it was sat at. It was, the pricing when we first went in was approximately four quid. People in the chat, correct me if I'm wrong. It was four quid for certain lagers. I think it was Heineken and maybe Amstel. And then it was five quid for a neck oil. And obviously, this has just gone up, right? And gone up and gone up. And look, a lot of this is inflation, right? There again, another two fingers, everyone. <laughs> But, but the point I would make, Sean, is that... I, 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 just, I need to drive because we've been going for nearly two hours. Yeah, yeah. and I, I, I need to get a sensible answer. Well, you've got the wrong person on the show. How do you... No, 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 I think it's been a, I think it's been a fantastic, fantastic show, mate. I've really enjoyed it. I definitely want to do this again with you 100% very soon as well. But I, I just need to get this. How do you consider... All the people that are up in arms, the people that are furious, yeah. they are talking their book. They are talking their book. Right, the people that are furious about the season ticket prices are probably mainly season ticket holders. The people that were quiet last year that weren't furious about the raising of the prices of match day tickets were well, the people that aren't going to be worried about that because they're already season ticket holders, right? You, but 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 those that had an issue anyway that were looking for a stick to beat Daniel Levy, forget about the freezing of the season tickets that affects forty five thousand people. Let's focus on the people that have to pay an extra eight pound for a category A ticket. And then this year, the pendulum swings back. Everyone's now going to go after Daniel Levy for that. He's damned if he does, he's damned if he doesn't. But who cares about who's sitting there advocating for the people that can't get a ticket? Who's advocating for the people that have yeah, spent Sean, 50 quid uh, on a one hot spur membership? Two, yeah. yeah, mate, that's a massive issue, right? And the one hot spur membership was something I was very hot on, right? Because I think that is a disgrace. There's, there's 200,000 of them, mate. I know. They can't and you're not get getting much. London Derby ticket. Yeah, but listen, and this is another thing that isn't talked about. There is not, and I'm telling you this, there is not as many people on the waiting list because they want season tickets. There is not. And I know your point about, you know, you're a single bloke, you're willing to just sit, you know, wherever Season you ticket could, waiting right? list is as high as it's ever been. It yes, mate, of course. But I'm, I'm going to tell you something, Sean. A lot of those people aren't on there. And look, don't get me wrong. Some of them would take a season ticket if they're ever offered one. But there's an awful lot of people that are members on the waiting list because you have to be on the waiting list to get the first dibs and the early, the 24-hour earlier access to buying tickets. If you aren't on that category, right. you've got yeah. no chance of ever buying a match day ticket. So Correct. you have got to be on the waiting list. Not everyone on... Mate, you've got a lot of the international fans are probably on that. They couldn't be season ticket holders even if they wanted to. Oh, they, right? they, they, they could, though, and that's the thing. I saw loads of people on Twitter that live overseas. Of they live course. in Spain, they live in America. They're season ticket holders. They buy the season ticket, and then they put nine out of ten games on the exchange. Yeah. For me, I think, that, I think that whole model is a joke. This yeah, idea... Crazy. This idea that you can, uh, we're changing the system now to protect the loyalty, to protect the efficacy of the, of the model. If you don't come, if you miss five games, then you, your season ticket will be taken away from you. Like that, like listen, I'm sitting here, I'm well, telling you, I have so many issues with Daniel Levy's models, especially yeah. around ticketing. But in terms of price price hikes or whatever price rises, which is the obvious, the obviously elephant in the room, I don't necessarily have Isn't an it? issue it's with it. Not, I don't understand. How, however, how, one sec, one sec. Let me, let me land. Let me land. The, uh, the, the, the part where I think it's crazy is the changes they have made is to say, if you miss five or six games, then you lose your ticket. You lose your ticket. But it doesn't matter if you buy a, buy a season ticket and put every single ticket bar the Arsenal one on the, on the exchange. That's crazy. fine. But if you don't, if you happen to be caught at work, caught in traffic, or you you lose your phone on the way to the stadium, but you had every intention going, but you can't sign in, then that counts as one of your five strikes against you. It's the most bonkers, ridiculous notion in the world. He's, he's, clo say, he's closing a loophole are, that no one uses. I'd love to you, know if you are a season ticket holder, know, you should have yeah. to go. You should have to go. You should have to go to half the ticket, half at least half the games. If you're living overseas and you're just you're you're holding your season ticket because you want to go to, to Arsenal, but you don't want to go to everything else. That, to me, is a problem. It's a problem. Yeah, but, yeah, but Sean, actually, I've just realised, because I had a similar question about this as you have. 
because I'm like, well, what if you're not going and you're selling it to other people? You're still not going. So what? Like, what are you doing if you're if you're missing more than four or five games? Like, are you really a scene to go? Most people but, don't go. Yeah, but it's just that, come to me. It's just come to me. Expression losing guy, right? He 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 doesn't. He's got a season ticket. He makes money from his watch along, so he doesn't go to most of the games. He'll go to Arsenal. He'll go to Chelsea. He'll go Mate, to Liverpool. Listen, respect he expressions. Yeah, respect the big man. I love respect. the guy. I think he's brilliant. He's brilliant, but he's just an example. Of yeah, people of that have a season ticket that don't go to most of the games, and that but, exchange is manipulated and utilized. I've come, up, I've come up with the reason why he's done that, Sean. It's very simple because, and I, and I know a few people, and I may be related to a couple of them, I may even be one of them, who at the end of last <laughs> season were so pissed off, boycotted games and didn't go. They didn't sell them on the exchange, which some people did and some Levy Out people did and then got stick for it. Oh, well, you're just selling your ticket. So it's not really a boycott, is it? Which I, you know, I can see the logic behind. But if I was to empty chair it and not go just to give it one of these to Levy over these ticket price rises, he's then going to turn around and say, oh, Phil P, you missed four games at the end of that season and you're a naughty boy. Give me your season ticket back. But look, the thing I would just say, Sean, right? I get what you're saying, but I do think there's two different elements here. The element that we haven't got enough capacity for all the people that want to come to Spurs is one thing, okay? And that's a terrible thing. My heart goes out to people that can't and maybe will never be able to have the same situation that I have with my family, right? Mm -hmm. I, I get it and my heart goes out to them. I wish we did have, you know, uh, a Spurs version of the new camp, or, or or even the, yeah, exactly. And look, no one wants that more than Levy. Levy would 100%. love Harrogate Council. Harrogate Council is guilty for a lot of this, yeah, but you know yeah, what? But they're, 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 they have their hands tied by transport problems and policing. There's well, a, there's well, a, there's we'll a, get to a point, and maybe this could be where, like, you know, some foreign investment into the club comes into play. It could get to the stage where Levy actually thinks, listen. Spending spending half a billion on local infrastructure could actually be worth. I said this it. the other day. I said this the other day. How much would it cost to build Mate. an additional underground an underground station all the way down from Seven Sisters? How much would it cost to drill that? Get Elon Musk's tunnel thing. Get the thing that built the uh, the Euro Tunnel. Drill yeah. the shit out of the underground of North of North London. Uh, it might yeah. cost you uh, might cost you four hundred million quid. Listen, mate, Levy needs to get on with building, you know, Levy Heights, the hotel, because listen, mate, he must be gutted because by the time that's finished, Sonny's going to be a club ambassador, and all the South Koreans are going to be gone. Mate, that place will be wall to wall. We might as well call it, you know, Soul Sisters, the, yeah. uh, the you know Levy Towers, the hotel. He could yeah, sell yeah. it out morning, noon, and night with uh, South Korean brothers and sisters, and God bless them. Right. I'm all up for the international fans. I'm not against it. Because, but listen to me. I'm telling you that capacity issue is separate. And look, don't get me wrong. The football, aside from anything else, imagine how much Levy would love to have a hundred thousand seat a stadium for Beyonce. You know, if we ever get well, boxing thing, again, right? we're going to carry, we're gonna carry on building that one. Ellie, but, but, I love, I love you, Ellie. Just, just super quick, Phil. Hey, I love you. You're happy. To, I'm happy for you to disagree. I know most people are going to disagree with me on this. It's absolutely fine. But like I say, I know that at the same time, everybody is, whether through any thought or thought of their own, they're virtue signaling this idealistic world where everybody can get access to Tottenham at a reasonable price. And unfortunately, scarcity has a value and it's yes. an inelastic demand. Cool. Not everyone can be satisfied. Those of you that want the shit, the price of the season tickets to stay super low for an ever aging population that are going to turn into season ticket holders, those prices will be handed over. The difference in re revenue will be handed over to the to the adult members over the next five years. So I don't personally want to have to pay four thousand pound for a ticket because somebody else became a, a season ticket holder at sixty. Sure, you mean there's a there's a there's a ceiling to how much you love your club? You wouldn't. I will pay it. I don't. I don't want to have to pay it. I don't want to have to pay it at the expense of somebody else who only got their season ticket at 64. One year clips into a 50% discount. I'm yeah, not up no. for that. I'm not okay with that. And also, I'm not okay with this notion you that you choose, because mate. you've been a season ticket holder for 20 years, that that means that you should, that no one else can ever be a season ticket holder, really? which is what we're yeah. advocating for by artificially suppressing the, the season ticket price is low. There's always someone that's going to lose out. And I haven't heard a solution from anybody around how you... Yeah, but listen, if I'm going to tell you something. People, how do you, how do you, how do you, how do you, how do you make those people feel better about it? I don't, I haven't listen, heard any solutions. Sean, 
there, I don't think there is a solution to that. But I'm here to talk to you about the season ticket pricing in the first element. And I'm going my my case and what I my plea to the club would be right is do something extraordinary right and don't go up with the ticket price hikes and don't do what they're doing to the to the seniors. And I, you make a good point about the longevity of the season uh, of the senior season to get holders, Sean, and about the scarcity. And about the fact that in years to come, when we're all, you know, in very short amount of time for me and a bit longer for you, um, you know, hopefully we get to that ripe old age and still living to see Spurs play. But my point is, we could actually change the game and say, right, because of all these other elements and all this other revenue streams that are coming in, the ticket pricing that we all pay makes such little difference to the revenue that the club earn now right and ever increasingly so or ever decreasingly so show so i should say you're at a situation where levy could actually turn around and say i am going to freeze a ticket freeze the ticket prices because look at all the other wonderful things i've done the club can be sustainable and grow and be where we need to be and you, the supporters, can still be loyal supporters and do all the things that you currently do and how well you support the club and not have to pay through the nose or pay even more through the nose than you currently are. Because how? Beyonce how? fans are paying for that. Formula yeah. One fans are paying for that. Right. Everyone internationally that pays for Premier League TV rights are paying for that. Right. So, Phil P, you stay on a £1,000. Johnny, you still pay your debenture. The chap in the tunnel club who can afford it and wants to have that experience still pays what he's paying. Oh, so we're saying means-tested season tickets now? No, I'm not saying that at all, mate. I'm saying differentiate your pricing band so people can have different experiences. Exactly. What I'm saying is do more of the same, but I'm saying don't just look at it and say, right, this is a business. This is a Qantas airline. Everyone it is a wants- business, mate. It is a business. It is, it a, is business. a business. But, Sean, what I'm saying to you is... It was still a business in COVID when there were no fans there, right? And the club, yeah. okay, it suffered. And look, look at the difference in revenues. I've got it right in front of me. Yes. Here we go. But, Bang. Mate, but we lost. Than, so we're, we're down. Yeah. We're down 180 million quid. All of that came from match day income, by the way. Yeah. That that giant drop there. That look at that. You can see the blue. Yeah. The blue is match day. Yeah. No blue so, at all. No blue. Look, on 2020, Massive. 150 yeah, million quid's worth. Of difference. Okay, but look at the difference between 17, 18. And 18, 19, and then 21, 22, and then 23, 20, uh, 22, 23. It's mm-hmm. already massively jumped up because we've got 62,000 people in, in the ground. Okay. Right. But what's right. wrong with maintaining at that level? It doesn't have to jump up. And the jump up so I'll tell you what. I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. Because you look at teams like Aston Villa. Yeah. Unai Emery is saying, uh, and Aston Villa make no, very, very little money. They make absolute pittance on a match day revenue. Right? Yeah. The stadium isn't worth. The stadium's nice, but it has, yeah. they don't have any any of that stuff. Aston Villa, like Aston Villa, don't know. They can't figure out right now whether they're going to be bre- in breach of FFP or not. Yeah. Whether they're going to lose six points next season or not. And six points difference, if they do get fined, will be the difference between getting in Champions League or not. So 60, 70 million quid in cool. revenue minimum, based on an infraction that the fact that they can't tell right now, Kieran Maguire, um, the the Swiss Ramble. The other fella, Stefan Bors, none of them know. It's the difference is about three million yeah. euros. Yeah. That's how close they are to the line. You know what? How much money are Tottenham going to make from this additional revenue in the season tickets? How about much? three million quid? Right? Exactly. We got we got the same amount for loaning Dyer for the last six months of his contract. No, but, but my point is, if you take that notion to everything, yeah. if Tottenham were to push the boat out. And spend yeah, yeah. 100 million quid on a player that we all think we should be able to. And the fact that Ange just yeah. said, no, we're never going to be able to. And once again, I see the same Levy out people in the comments here talking about this from the start, saying Daniel Levy's Tottenham never going to spend 100 million quid. If we were to be the club yeah. that spent 100 million quid on a player, then we are the sort of club that gets very close to that FFP line. And then you know what? It might be 3 million quid difference. That makes you one side of the line or the other. And okay. if it's Tottenham, if Tottenham never put up prices, despite the fact that there is a never-ending stream of people willing to pay a higher price, just because we have to think about the sensitivities of people who have been a season ticket holder, who have had the privilege of watching Tottenham for 25 years, when everyone else would absolutely bend over backwards to get the opportunity but can't, or to the same point, if 
the HMRC puts up the, the duty on beer sales by three pence per pint. And Daniel Levy says, uh, let's just wear it. Let's just let's just wear that cost. Yeah, sheet. If I don't, someone's going to say Levy out. Then at the yeah, end of the of day, mate, you're going to be in a position at some point where Tottenham might be falling foul of FFP by three million quid or five Sean, million quid. And then, this, and then the season's can over. I, can I make a date with you? If we ever fall foul of FFP by three million, because Levy didn't put up the season ticket price. It's happened to Villa. It's happening to Villa. It's already happened to Nottingham Forest. It's happened to Everton twice, Phil. Yes, so it mate. can happen. I, I, I know it can happen, mate. But I'm telling you, we're not going to be in a position under Levy's stewardship where we're going to push the boat out so much that it's going to be the three million that he didn't raise. Because, and also the fact that he is going to raise them. Let's get let's get this right. Levy's definitely of your mindset, not of mine. I'm saying we. Right, you are of my mindset, mate. You 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 you, were part you participate in the same economy as let, I do. Yeah, yeah, but you listen, work bro. in the same industry as I did. Listen, we, bro. But you are you're, you're the same guy exactly. as I am. Mate, just... I've got, listen, I've got the staying power, brother. I'm still in it. You're the one who jibbed out, right? Now listen. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you got no bottle, mate. Come on. Listen. No, I'm you're right. You, you're right. I'm you're right. Yeah. You, I want Spurs, right? Everyone, Sean saw this. Look at this. Look at this. And this wasn't bought in Shoreditch, as I told Sean. This has been in my wardrobe <laughs> for 30 years, broski, okay? When I see quality, I buy quality. What I'm telling you is I want, I believe in Spurs. I think Spurs are the greatest football club in the world. And I'm telling you, Levy is on the precipice of doing exactly that, putting us right at the top table. But I'm not just talking about on the football pitch. If he did what I'm suggesting, right, bring in a more German model to the Premier League, he will be lauded as one of the best chairman of all time. And I'm telling you, take that opportunity, Levy, and you will be remembered more than for what you're going to be remembered for at the moment. Build a winning football club, but do the right, right thing by the supporters and everyone will be happy Which except supporters? Sean Which Butler. Supporters? Right. Which the, supporters? The ones that have already got access or the ones that are crying out to get access? Well, listen, bro, why do people vote for... Um, political parties when they're on lower tax brackets that are going to give tax breaks to the higher income earners. Why? Because they're aspirational, right? One day, Phil P is going to drop dead. I'm for, I'm, look, I know it's sad to contemplate this, Sean. And you'll have your season ticket every day until then. Exactly. Some, uh, but when you'll I'm have dead. your seat that someone else would do anything to get exactly. and is willing to pay more for, but you're unhappy that you at, you're being asked but to listen, pay. One Only day. a one and a half percent rise a one and a half percent rise on average over the last six years. It's how not happy, unreasonable. How not happy unreasonable. will how happy will the person that is arriving in Tottenham on a jetpack, right, with beer guns, jetpack beer guns, <laughs> right, through the sky, coming in through the roof, through the roof. They're coming in through the roof, sitting in my seat. This is dedicated to Phil P. Right, shout out block two five eight South Stand all the way. Um, yep. Right, who who will be happier than that person, right, in 2061, right, 100-year anniversary of the double side, who is own. look at Jarvis's tail there in the background. Um, how happy is that person going to be when they're having to pay 57 quid for a pint of beer, but they're still only having to pay £1,000 for a season ticket? And there'll be a, stat a little statue, tiny little statue of Levy underneath the Bill Nicholson statue because Levy was the one who said, I'm freezing ticket prices forever. You're never going to pay more than a grand to watch Spurs in the South Stand. You know what? You know what? There'll be a certain section would say, well, if you can do that, then you can drop the prices to where they were the year before. Levy out. Levy yeah, yeah. out. And, and listen, I'll be with them. But what I'm saying, Sean, <laughs> is, there is a, you, there's a utopian version. There's a utop, utopian version. I love of you, football, Phil. You're brilliant. Right? Yeah. There's a utopian version of football that borrows from the German model, right? But has the rampant commercialism that you're looking for, shifting overpriced beers to NFL supporters, right? That will never be seen in North London again. They're getting out of there in the quickest Uber they can find because they've never seen anything like it. They're coming over because of the weak pound. Shout out to, to Liz Truss, right? 
Thanks, Liz Truss. You've made it affordable for all American football fans from America to come to England to watch football. Could you crash the economy, right? They're all coming over from south side of Chicago. And they're looking around Tottenham thinking, Jesus Christ, get me an Uber. I've got to get the hell out of here. But they're still tanked up on overpriced Budweiser because Levy has got the pricing right for the different ventures that he's getting this. If he gets the 30 non-football uh, events at the stadium, Brilliant. Levy, go and do it. And I'm not virtue signaling. It's phenomenal, right? I'm right. all for that. So, 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 as long as, so as long as someone's paying it, but it's not you, then it's okay. Exactly, bro. Listen, when was the last time you turned down a free beer? The top of the show, you said you went and took a free ticket to watch Spurs under 21. So don't give me that <laughs> flannel butler. No, You're on that train as well. Take, I didn't take a free ticket. It was free to go and watch it. It was there was no it, oh not someone God. didn't give me a ticket that they it's paid been. for. It was just it was, there was no ticket to make it was just go and see it. Wait, I okay. didn't listen, mate. I, okay. <laughs> okay. If someone just, had, just if someone correct my point, you didn't pay 100. any money to watch a game of football. Sean Butler, you didn't pay any money to watch a game of football. Right. Like, and no one else did either. So I'm just exactly. participating in the market economy. But you Maybe. know what? Borrenwood, Borrenwood FC, the devil that they are for, for joining up with uh, yeah. with Arsenal, Ooh. they made about 20 quid out of me in concession on the night so and it's all actually, good everyone's well, happy this is, this is a good point that i want to make i do want to make this right i'm going to tell you something it was cheaper to go and watch and 10 of um the peas all went down to the stadium to watch Shakhtar donetsk right uh a couple of my nephews went for the first time actually three of my nephews went for the first time my niece went for the first time really big family day out my wife went for the first time in many years um, and we were properly in the, the prawn sandwich brigade, uh, probably up near where Johnny probably sits. So, Johnny, sorry if you found any of my uh, uh, my rubbish when you went to the first game of the season against Man U. But I do tend to take my litter with me because I'm nice like that. Um, right. And we went. Uh, cheaper tickets at a K, so it was packed out. The club shop was ramo, Sean, because people yeah. would go for the first time or have more money to spend. And this is the point I would make, Right. Everyone's got a pool of cash to spend, okay? That, that's just normal. So if I've got a certain amount of money to spend with me and my kids and my dad when I go to a game, but we're spending more of it on the season tickets, I'm then disgruntled. And obviously, because I'm Levy out, right, mm. I'm then not going to spend it on beer in the stadium. But if Levy did the right thing, another major block of Enoch out, Levy out falls away. And he's building a team and he's back in Ange. And all of a do sudden... Do you really think that he hasn't factored that stuff in? Do you not think he's got people in that are pricing out economic, like pricing out models of drop prices by this much? What does that uh, extrapolate out to in additional I revenue can, spend? Johnny, I can only hope and imagine that he does because we know... Well, of course he does. This, of course this, he does. Course, he's working in a system of inelastic demand. Like, to the point already, he has... He would much prefer we were all single-use tickets, right? He would rather we none of us were seeing ticket holders because every single person that comes, and again, shout out to all our brothers and sisters from Korea because, listen, they're not just... Hey, hang, on, hang on a second, hang on a second. T -t 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 this notion that he doesn't reward loyalty is also nonsense. He, he doesn't... He hasn't changed the away seat, the away ticket allocation thing, which I think is ridiculous. I think that you have, you know somewhere between a thousand and four thousand fans that go to every away game but the vast majority of them are the same people that have had tickets forever and that he could have changed that model he could have sliced that in half and gone 50 percent allocation to the loyalty points which would have priced out the very next tier down from the most loyal season ticket holders ever and given 50 percent to a ballot he didn't do any of those things i have a problem with the away season ticket thing. I think it creates a bubble. I think that it creates a system where you pass pass people on, you sell tickets yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. So I think there's massive issues with that, but he yeah, has recognized yeah. he has right. recognized loyalty in the away. He, he recognize he he absolutely rewards loyalty in line with market forces. And I think that anyone that sits here and is is arguing that price rises are unrealistic. I I take the empathetic, passionate, emotional view, and I understand the fact that senior citizens shouldn't necessarily be punished because they've moved into a certain tier and therefore you're losing the revenue and Tottenham can't continue to do it. But you know what? It's going to be a thing. It's already been replicated by Arsenal, who don't even have anywhere near as many concession stands as Tottenham do. 
It's going to happen at United. It's going to happen at City. It's going to happen at Villa. Yeah, but Sean, this is my point. I want us to be different. I want us to be the best. I want. Us... No, I'd, Listen, I'd like us to be dream world but, scenario but, as well, mate. It doesn't the work away like fans, that. Does yeah, but the away fans is an interesting thing, right? Because all the things you've said are right. But I know. the other the other side of it is though, <laughs> who are the? I would say the Spurs away support is one of the best anywhere in football. They're always loud. They're always proud. Yep. And they're bringing the noise, mate. Wherever they go, they're bringing the noise. And we, listen, if does we... That does that change, though, if you put 20% of the allocated lot into a ballot? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. I don't know. But th this is a point, though, Sean. We are in a situation where, with what he's doing with the season ticket price rise, and I know you probably will argue this because of uh, the stance you have, but there are going to be people that this is the final straw, whether it's financially or whether it's just that. And my knee-jerk reaction to this was, mate, I've told you how passionate about and grateful I am about how I've got my situation and how many tickets we have as a family. But I'm telling you, me and my dad discussed seriously about jacking it in because we think it's beyond the pale. What he's doing is a piss take in our eyes, right? And well, one and a half percent rise every year. Do you get mad when you go to the co-op and see a price of, or go to Audi and see the price of eggs has gone up 200% in the last two years? Yes, mate. But what I'm saying to you is, as a point of principle, we just think it's wrong. But are we going to do anything about it to the first point you made? No, exactly. Are no one's not? doing about it. But, Everyone's going to write, they'll write a few tweets, they'll like a few tweets, they'll share a few tweets, they'll come on here and tell me I'm a dickhead. But ultimately, those of you that have access oh, yeah, to yeah, Actually, the sorry, Sean, I meant to say. You're a, You're a dickhead. Oh, I get yeah. it. It's fine. It's fine. I'm just playing the other side of the coin for balance. But at the end of the day, all of you that have already got access to tickets are not going to give up your access to your tickets. Neither am I. Neither are people. And the people yeah, but... that are still waiting in line are going to have to wait a long time. Yeah, but Sean, this is the point, yeah? Some people, right? Not me, not you, okay? Let's just have it as it is. We're, we, you know, we're going to keep going, right? We're going to put up with it. You because you think it's sensible. Me because, you know... I swear to Christ, I'm going to see that bloke out, right? I will be there. <laughs> I will be there, Levy. I'll be there waiting. And when you go, look, I know it's not the right thing. And I'm, look, I'm not saying when you Phil, die. Phil, but... Phil, someone's at my door. I'm, I'm, listening. I'm still going to, it's literally right there. So I'll still hear right. you. Okay. Go, go on your rant. I'll put you, right. on the, put you on the big screen. Yeah. Here you go. Right, listen, everyone. The time has come. He's, he's enlarged himself, for God's sake. Oh, here we go. Listen, Sean Butler TV has been taken over by Levy out. Enoch out has now taken over. The revolution will be televised on YouTube. For everyone who joined to see a debate, there is no debate. Levy, you're dead meat. Stop messing around with the ticket prices. Respect your elders. Chapter one, page one. Who raised you? Respect your elders. Stop pissing off the older fans. They put enough into this club. Blood, sweat and tears over many years. You don't need this, Levy. You don't need the grief for three million quid. What's three million to you? That's probably a pedicure for, for smoking Joe in prison. Pedicures cost a lot more. You know, bodily fluids and that, right? So just, look, do the right thing, Levy. You know it makes sense. Listen to Phil P. Live and exclusive on Sean Butler TV. Now the world famous home of Enoch Out. Um, but listen, we've all got to be sensible about this. No one's no one's going to listen to me. Levy's not going to listen to me. He's not going to create some sort of utopian ticket price scenario where they're going to be paying a lot less uh, or we're all going to be paying a lot less um, for this. Well oh, Sean, you're back. Sorry. Well okay. <laughs> Enoch out, Enoch out will now hand back over the reins of Sean Butler TV to the man <laughs> himself. Um, but listen, look, I, I just think, right, that it's two separate things. But I know people, Sean, that are diehard Spurs that over the last few years, whether it's generally what's been going on at the club or how Levy is or just have had, had enough. And now this is, there's going to be a few people, even if it's only 20, right? We're going to lose 20 people, right? And they're going to be replaced. I'm not saying they're going to be replaced by less, uh, like, you know, they are going to be people that love the club. But I'm just I'm just putting it out there that they may wear chinos more than tracksuit bottoms. That's all I'm going to say, right? So I'm Doesn't not saying they're, they're not real fans. Fan, right? Doesn't mean they're less I'm of a Tottenham not, fan, though. I'm not, I'm not saying they're less of a Tottenham fan. I'm just saying they're not I as good. You're, I know you're not, but I think I'm there is, saying, there not is a notion. Listen, there is a no, there is a one hundred percent a notion that 
Real fans are priced out and the prawn sandwich brigade is all that's going to be left. Listen, I'm, I'm going to ask a question, right? Will Levy, if he's going to go ahead with these ticket prices, right, forget the fab, because whoever's on the fab, I don't know what's going on. I want to be there with Lewis and the rest of the ticket uh uh, the, the, the ticket uh, office crew and I want to be checking everyone I do house visits to everyone who's getting new season tickets and if they haven't got any merch original merch I'm not talking about some trendy shop in Shoreditch where you paid 250 quid for a long sleeve you know uh, umbro top from 91 I'm talking about like you bought it on the day and you've managed to keep it until this day in history. Yeah. I want to know exactly what's going on. I want to know how long you've been a fan and I want to, you know, get in the weeds. When did you start supporting the club? Show me your credentials. When was the last time you had a ruck? When was the last time you went on a YouTube channel <laughs> and had it with Declan Rice? We want to know. We want to know what are your credentials? What sort of fan are you? And listen, if they don't wear socks, right? If you're not wearing socks with your shoes, Get out of town, mate, because that's just right. unhygienic. Listen, if you're not willing to sweat up enough in the stands that you need a sock to absorb some sweat on your feet, <laughs> you're not, you, you know, you're, you're no sort of football fan to me. And you can stick your fashion sense up your backside as well. Nice. Nice. Listen, Phil, I, I, I love your passion. And I think that there's a lot of logic to everything you're saying. I just and I think that the emotional it's not side financially of financially logical. It's not financially logical, Sean, but I think there is a way that this could be done that would set a precedent. And 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 your actually one thing, Sean, your point about Villa is well made, but this is the thing. Spurs aren't Villa. Spurs are Spurs. And thanks to the great work that Levy's done on the financial side. We can afford to do something completely off, off piece, off script, and flip the script on this whole fan, um, you know, fandom in the UK. We could do something that no club is is can do or will be willing to do. How good would it be to do that to freeze season ticket prices? If he turn around and say season ticket prices are frozen for five years, have that Gooners actually say that on the statement. Have that Gooners, Coy's Daniel. All of a sudden, everyone's going to be, oh, mate, I'm going to be whirling my apart top Apart from the people, head. apart from the 100,000 people that are waiting in line. No, mate, they're aspirational, Sean. Listen, respect the people on the waiting list, mate. They don't want to pay through the I don't think we are, though. Really I think, this is, I think this, is a, this is part of the conversation. They I'm won. trying to make sure that every every angle is covered here. We've spent two, and a, two, and a, two hours and 22 minutes now and we've got discussing nowhere. this. I think we've got absolutely nowhere, but I think we've had a really good, a really good chat. But ultimately, I think that Everyone, I still maintain this idea that everyone talks their book. Everyone wants to have as much as they possibly can and give as little back as possible in terms of like just life generally. They, they want what they want and they, and they can't afford much as they want. But for every person that is going to benefit from a price freeze, there's another person that's going to suffer. For every person that's going to suffer from a price rise, there's another person that's going to benefit. And there's no, you're not entitled, just like Tottenham fans are not entitled to a trophy. Tottenham fans should not feel entitled to their ticket forevermore at without condition. I think that the conditions of life are that market forces in a capitalist world, a capitalist democratic world, whether you like it or hate it, unless you're advocating for socialism, where everyone gets the same, despite what value you put in, which I don't think has ever been a successful narrative. And unfortunately, there's always going to be people that can have a little bit more than others. It's not cool. It's not ideal, but it is what it is. And I think that the, the the overarching idea of putting up season ticket prices by one and a half percent per year for the last five years really isn't that unreasonable. It really isn't. And I think that Daniel Levy, if he makes, if he sets a precedent around, oh, it's only three million quid or it's only five million quid, I'm not going to do it, then it won't be appreciated by the people that hate him. People that hate him just press pause on their hate when they don't have a dog in the fight like they didn't for the first six months of this season. When everything was positive, they sat on their hands. And as soon as there was a chance, out they come. So any any goodwill from Daniel Levy is never appreciated. About, it's never respected. It's just, okay, I don't have an opportunity to hit him with a stick on this particular issue. Therefore, I will put my stick away. But let me wait until the next opportunity comes. And Daniel Levy set in the precedent of freezing season tickets one year. The next time he raises them, they'll say, well, you did it before. Why can't you do it again? Which is the situation we find ourselves in now. So I think that reasonable adjusted inflation-adjusted price rises are okay they're okay 
And anyone that says they aren't, I still haven't heard a justifiable reason to explain it other than I want more for less because the rest of the world is punching me in the face everywhere I look. Why can't Tottenham support me? And it doesn't work that way in my world. Listen, Sean, I appreciate where you're coming from, but OK isn't the standard that I'm setting. I want us to be the best. I want Spurs to be something that other fans look at and think, I wish I was Spurs. They already think about it with the stadium, right? I hope to God they won. They do it. They're starting to do it with the manager. And I hope to God one day they'll do it about the football team, right? And, I, you know, honestly, there's an opportunity here to do something different. And look, Levy, right, Levy, he, he needs to take a leaf out of my book. I love when people doubt me. Hey, listen, bring it on. Say what you want. I love it. Just go, you know, like War for Ducks back. Levy would love to prove me and everyone else wrong. And look, there's only about 50 of us. There's only 50 Levy out people. So he doesn't have to do much to prove it. No, there's a, hell of a lot of there. people, there's a hell of a lot of people that will put a purple and gold banner in their Twitter profile. That will, as I said, said already, they'll write a few tweets. They'll like a few tweets. They'll retweet a few things. They'll call people that call, that have a different perspective, this and that. And I know that there's a lot of people on the non-Levy outside on Twitter who go after Levy out people with the same apathy for their opinion, the same yeah, disinterest. That's, that's social media, mate. It's, it's social media. I, I know it is what it is, but I, I even just, mentioned... You know, for the wrong ones, I text Stell, uh, And right? some good people. Uh, I text Stell yesterday or last night, I think it was, because um, I asked him, I said to him, are you going to be giving up your season ticket? And he said, no, no, I'm not. And then he, he gave, he, he wrote a long text to me yeah. explaining his, his stance on it. And I think his stance is entirely reasonable. He's consistent yeah. with his take. Sort of support the team, not the regime is basically. Yeah. I think, I think his stance is reasonable. And I think his, I think his. But he, um, get, he gets a lot of grief. mate. He has more, he has more frustration people. with, with people who. He has more frustration with people that, that talk, that the, talk, the people that will yeah. like a few tweets and t retweet a few things, but don't actually stand up for anything. And like I say, to those people, like I said to him, I think that's, that's just social media. Right? It's a lot of people that ultimately yeah. will cry a little bit, but will pay the money because they don't want to lose their ticket. And they know that there's someone else waiting for the chance to get it. And that's but just mate, life. This, this is the thing. And I've, I'm sure I said this to you when uh, Levy Out was kicking up last year, maybe even before. Even the moderate people, right, that want change at Spurs, I would just say lend the support to the cause of Enoch out, Levy out. Even if you don't think it's – well, obviously, if you don't think it's reasonable, don't do it. Don't do something that you don't think is reasonable. Well, for God's sake. Um, but even if you just want better for Spurs, I would argue by lending it your voice, by lending us support, it's a bit like a protest vote in a midterm election, right? Anyone who anyone who thinks that Levy isn't um, mindful of the noise on social media, the 50 fans that are no noisy when they were uh, some of us outside uh, the club shop, and obviously Daigle and, and yeah, to those, and to those people, that, those people that are passionate enough to give up their, you know, people like Brian Daigle, people like um, Isaacs, Ryan Isaacs, yeah. those guys, yeah. people like Graham, people like Stell, people like you know, the, those guys that that want to go and give up their Saturday on a freezing cold January the 31st on 2022. I remember it, <coughs> you know, bitterly cold and they're going to spend the whole day outside the training ground. I've got full respect. I've said it a thousand times um, on my dog, my dog walks. I've got full respect for anybody who shares a different opinion to me, but who backs it with energy and not an action and not sure. just, not just words on a, on a screen. Cause talk is cheap. I don't personally share, share the same energy. And I think that, to your point, like loosely give your support towards Enoch out. I think that's a dangerous thing because I think you, what you really need to have is you need to know exactly how big the, 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 the movement really is and what it stands for. You know? And I think that the, the change for Tottenham thing was just an opportunist from someone, uh, you know, to try to yeah, fill that, the ground, fill the middle, yeah, fill the that, void. That, it was, all was nonsense, a bit, you know? Yeah, it was nonsense, but look, that's, that was a shame to me because there was a missed opportunity there. But in the end, look, I, this is the thing I think. Even though that it was a, it was small and it's not perfectly formed, you know, there's, there's wrong ends all over the place, right? But the people that I've met at protests are all pretty reasonable people. They're not, you know, yeah, they're they not are. monsters. They're not, I, mean, like, I, I meet them all at, at Tottenham games and they'll come yeah. up to me and go, I don't agree with you, Sean, but, you know, 
Yeah. Let's have a beer. You know? But Great. And, and it's the thing. But and and look, almost goes without saying, but again, for the drinking game, uh people out there playing playing the Spurs buzzword bingo. Uh, we all want the best for the club, right? So there it is, another two fingers. Um, in the end of the day, right, you've, I, I just think that Levy does pay attention to this stuff. Anyone who thinks he doesn't hasn't been paying attention. The, the, the fact that when there was Levy out and the balloons on the pitch, not saying that I had anything to do with it, but they're still in my drawer if anyone needs any. Um, <laughs> there, there's... There's a situation, right, where he he looked a bit solemn, but he, you know, you couldn't really read too much into it. He looked a bit pissed off, but his his wife touched him on the knee, and what's this? He wants you. A, he wants a customary woo. <laughs> woo! There you go. There you go. Phil, Wait, Phil, how, much, Phil, how much time do you still have, man? You, you said you had oh, to go. I've, I've, I've got to be at work or at Monday morning. So uh, oh, okay. You know, but well, do you want to keep going? Because I've got people that want to... Danny Kiriaki wants to come in and, and oh, no, uh, swear. I, I, refuse, I refuse to share the screen with a, uh, you know, with a wannabe... Uh, a wannabe Greek. Defender. No, he's, he's just... You know <laughs> what I mean? He's Just because he's got an ITK uh, radar and that bun, Dragasin wannabe, mate. Greek Dragasin, that's what he is. Um, All right, we're going to keep, we're gonna keep have, going. I do have to drop off. I do have to drop off in about 10 minutes. But the thing I would just say... 10 minutes. Okay. Danny, you've got 10 minutes. You can come in and have your rant and then we can finish off. The thing I I would just say is he does care. His wife touched his knee. This does affect him. And look, the other thing I would say, a lot of the things that we throw on Levy and the characterizations we make of him, it's like we don't really know. We, We hardly ever hear from the bloke. We only see what actions he takes. So we we throw a lot of this stuff at him uh, and we don't really know too much about it. Me personally, I think a lot of the decisions at Spurs have been taken by Joe Lewis, you know, above Levy's head. I call no, him I Danny. I don't, think that, I don't believe that at all. Yeah, okay. But I just I just think in a lot of ways, he, you know, I call him Danny the Batman. I think Daniel Levy, I, I, I genuinely think, there's a guy, I don't know if you know, I think you might be in the same chat as him, um, Pete. Uh, you know yeah, Pete? Yeah. Yeah. Absolute legend. I'm going to get Pete on as well for the second episode or third episode of On the Other Hand, because he always gives a good take. I think it was him who was telling me like he he sort of he figured out watching the uh, all of one document. I think it was him said all the all the, the all of one documentary. When you start seeing Daniel Levy sitting in the lunchroom with the players at the training ground, yeah, day to day, there should be Chinese walls, right, or divisions of labor. But when I when I was working in um, in America for a, for a big company, my manager he had the perfect balance of like accessibility and familiarity. He was always like you. You could go up and have a chat with him and get advice or tell him what was going on or whatever else. And he was nice enough that you could feel confident and comfortable yeah. around him. But he was never. He would never allow you to bleed over into overly familiar, so that if he had to chastise you, he would feel awkward doing it. I think oh, a bit like Ange me, now, right? A bit like Ange now. Correct. Correct. Hundred percent. Exactly that. But on a corporate level, Daniel Levy should not be having lunch in the canteen with Harry Kane or whoever. You know what I mean? Can I just say though, I, I think some of that was for the cameras. I, I, in my opinion, yeah, yeah, Look, yeah. May, maybe those who want to throw the whole sort of penny pinch narrative at him, it's just because you know he's saving, he's saving on like the cost of heating up his own toast at home. Do you know what I mean? Coming in and eat, you know, <laughs> eating on the company dime. Um, yeah, yeah. But, uh, so maybe there is an element to that. You know what I mean? Switch the heating off, Sharon. I'm going into the office. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Get it, getting the boys from the gardening team at a hotspur way to go around and do his hedges afterwards and all that sort of thing. Um, let me ask, I'll, let me ask this, Phil. Let me ask this because if Danny, you've got 10, you've got 30 seconds to uh to come on and have your rant. If you don't, if I don't see you in the next minute, then I've sent you the link, mate. If I don't see you, the next, if I don't see you in the next minute, mate, then I'm just, we're gonna uh, you've, we're got gonna... No chance. you've got no the, the nice. fact that the, 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 bun, the bun showing up on time, mate, is you know, it's taking Greek time to another level, mate. It's so let, let me let me ask you this then, like as, as the final question. We started the show, the show's titled Tottenham will never spend a hundred million pounds on a player. Now, that might be the case, we might not ever get there because of a bunch of reasons. It might be that. Um, the FFP brings in the fact that inflation makes the, what is currently a hundred million pound player go back to seventy. Do you envision that Tottenham will sign in the next it, during Angie's reign? However long that lasts, one more window, three more windows. Do you envision Tottenham signing a statement signing, whether that costs a hundred million, whether it's a club record signing? But I'm, I'm gonna, but not. Uh, 
a statement signing in name and stature, but not one that we're taking advantage of like a James Madison, but someone that we're paying full value for yeah. that is going to be that next level? Or do you think that what Angie's saying is, I don't want I don't want a big name. I don't want an Ivan Tony comes in with an attitude. I don't want a Vlaevich who comes in with a big yeah. salary bill. I don't want a insert name here. I'm happy with Brennan Johnson level players, but I want a few of them. I'd love to say yes, but I no, mate, we're not going to see that. We're not going to see that. That's not our style. I thought so. I thought like, you know, us even stumping up whatever proportion of the wages to bring Bale back. I thought maybe that was the start of a sea change. You know, you could point at when Kane got his first 200 grand a week contract. Uh, you know, that was a bit of a, a, a change, a sea change in the wage structure at that time. I just can't see it, Shawnee. I just can't see whether it's actually the sum of 100 million. Of course, one day with inflation, another two fingers for the drinking game. Um, I think the um, for the 100th time we will say inflation on this stream. Inflation, inflation, inflation. You're actually doing it. You're playing. Your I am actually doing game. it, yeah. It's non-alcoholic beer. But it's listen, low next, alcoholic beer. It's 3% beer, but, you know, it is what it is. <laughs> some people, that's normal beer, Sean. I've got yeah, to say. true, true, uh, true. Listen, true. next time we do this show, we're going to do the drinking game live on live on right. stream. Because that's All when right. you get really loose, Sean. He gets really <laughs> loose. Uh, You're going back to season one of the Spurs talk show then, back in exactly. 2021 when I was five-hour streams and 17 <laughs> pints of lager. No, I remember them. With chairs yeah. collapsing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was before that's Elton John cool. gave you Doctor Who share. Um, 100%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just One day we will get there, but I just, in terms of the money actually being spent is 100 million, but I just don't think it's Levy's, you know, style. He's not going to go out and do that even if we've got the financial punching power. And again, going back to what I, I said earlier, I don't think you've been, pay, you've been paying attention. He One, I'm not just saying he's not going to change, a leopard doesn't change his spots because that's not how he's operated. I also just think from an FFP point of view, he's not all of a sudden going to light up a lardy dar and go, now you're playing my game, bitches, and start lashing out the cash. Do you know what I mean? The old yeah. money gun. He's not going to be walking around like he's in a rat. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> You know what I mean, <laughs> loads of people shaking their bits in the background. You know what I do think? I do think back. that I, I genuinely do think that as much as this might be um, small compensation to those people that are feeling the pinch, I do think that if Tottenham have made a decision to raise season ticket prices by six percent and done the dastardly deed of of starting to curtail concessions, I think to not go big in the summer would be a disastrous PR move. I think that the only way that this will be forgiven and forgotten, or not forgiven, but at least temporarily forgotten, will be if yeah, there is gone. some significant yeah, but, spend in the summer. Yeah, but this is this is the point I'm making, Sean. Levy doesn't see that there's anything wrong with what he's done. He is right. drinking from the same water cooler as you in yeah. that, I'm a fucking hero. I've only raised it by an average of one and a half percent a year. So why is everyone upset? The yeah. OAPs have got to pay some money. I mean, most of them are still getting a 25% discount. Isn't that great? Look, if you it's the frog in a boiling pan of water argument, isn't it? Mm -hmm. The fact he's turned he's changed the temperature up bit by bit by bit. So the elderly frogs in the stadium don't realize they're being boiled to death. Lee. Either you're still killing the frogs, but obviously now you're dropping a new frog who's just turning 65 into the water. They're going to think, fucking hell, this water's boiling. I've got to get the fuck out of it. Right. It's the same thing, but he's not. And he doesn't mind if a few people boil to death because there's a million tadpoles. Yeah, but exactly. But he, because he doesn't think it's wrong to cook frogs, he's then not going to go and buy Vlahovic for 100 million because he hasn't got anything to make up for. He doesn't right. see there's a problem here, Sean. Right. This is the thing. Yeah. Okay. Right. So he he is going oh, to. I still, still I still think I still think that. Mate, okay, yeah, okay. So I, I take he, your point. And, and also, let's go back to an earlier topic. He's also got a manager who is of the same mindset. Where do well, I do really you, want okay, to spend okay, hundred million? Do I really question, want yeah. to spend hundred million? No, no, don't is get Ange, me wrong. Is Ange singing from? Is Ange playing ball? Is Ange like towing the line, or yeah, does Ange actually, actually does Ange actually work to that same? motif i don't need 100 million pound players he said before the difference between a 100 million pound player and the next tier down is not that meaningful the difference is mentality and yeah, actually, this, this, is, this is the point this is the point right and Ange made it well i i personally i think it was a mistake for him to say we're not going to spend 100 million 
Because even though I think he's spot on and how he laid it out is absolutely right, I think it sends the wrong signal to Levy and it sends the wrong signal out into the world as well, you know. Mm -hmm. So it, on that basis, anyone accusing him of being a yes man has, has now got some fuel. Me personally, and I put it in, I think when uh, maybe Stell was debating this on one of his shows, I said, I don't see him as a yes man. I see him, see him and maybe playing on the Australian sort of situation. I see him as a, a yes mate sort of bloke. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And what I okay. mean by that is he's almost saying it tongue in cheek. He's saying, oh, yeah, mate. Like, you know, we're not going to spend... I actually think the way he is... And the Australian demeanour about oh Jesus H Christ! I oh, know. Look at look what the cat. He's, look what he's the actually turned in. up. He's look actually what the turned up. Dragged in. Jesus. What? Listen, I want to know. Yeah, I, right? I yeah, know. Are you living in a homeless shelter in Amsterdam? Because that mate, you look like you've got all your possessions in one place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we don't have we don't have a lot of storage space in this in this flat. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This is your streaming centre. You've also got to go in with all, all the uh, all the all the bits of uh, all the bits of tat. Now, listen. Before I let you go, Bun, I've got to just say this. I just think he is a great mixture, Ange. Of I think what you see is what you get, and that typical Aussie type thing. Not to paint with a sort of xenophobic brush, but I think he's going in having very full and frank conversations with Levy about what's needed, about what's possible. But I also think he's pragmatic, right? A bit like. When people moan to me about their boss, and it's like in a work scenario, oh, my bo the boss is this, the boss is that. Listen, there wouldn't be blues music if bosses weren't wankers. Everyone who's got power misuses power, right? That's just life, right? Mm. Every chairman probably in the history of football, the managers fought their arseholes to one cool. extent or another. They're never going to get every player they want, but it's just about can we get the players we need. I think Ange is, we're going back to the right manager at the right time. Right. I actually think it was Ponzi scheme type situations to bring in the likes of Conte and the likes of. Uh, um, oh, I like that Ponzi scheme. Marino. Yeah. Just convince, just convince them a little bit more to get them get additional buy in. I like that. Mate, he, was, he, was really, mate, he was really in the soup at the time. So 100%. we're spending 18 million on a manager, which is a lot less than we're able to get a, a, a bang average. Mm. Copyright. I really like that. It's a good, good, good analogy. Yeah, well, that was Ponzi it's, scheme. We, mate, we were spending yeah. less on their wages than he was on Serge Aurier, mm. a really poor fullback. So, of course, look, and that shut the fan base up for a while. For six months, okay, we're dealing with it. But then he wasn't giving those, it was the wrong managers for the wrong club. It was never going to work, right? And obviously, yeah. that's with the gift of hindsight. But if you're not going to give Conte or Mourinho, Conte or Mourinho style players, it's not going to work. They were look. We're not Chelsea. We're not going to back them in the same way as Roman backed them. Those mm. managers. So it's not going to work. But with Ange and with Prime Potch, we we're willing to give these managers players that are on the up to a manager who's on the up, and all of a sudden, everyone's goals and objectives are aligned. Yeah, I think Ange's goals and objectives are aligned with Levy's and the clubs with where we're at. I think if we keep signing. The, the type of players for the type of money that we're signing them for, this will go in the right direction. But where it falls down is, and, and this is a worry that I have, you can find gems at the back. You can maybe even find gems in the midfield. Getting the ball in the back of the net is that still the hardest thing in football. Yeah. It's still the most, most sought after thing in football. And uh, finding a number nine is like finding the rocking horse poo. You just it, like it doesn't exist anymore. You know, good luck. Well, right? not unless you're willing to spend 80, 90 million quid. Exactly. And that's the point, Sean. You can play money ball. Which is why fight. I don't which is why I, I don't think it's unreasonable to 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 envision Tottenham, maybe not on a nine, because I think nines are difficult to find right now, but up somewhere at the top end of the pitch, whether it's Neto, whether it's Rafinha, whether it's yeah. um, Ivan Tony or mate, whoever. Listen, I, I, I don't think it's, I don't right. think it's unreasonable I mean, to see knocking on the door of a club record signing this summer. Yeah, but I just the problem will be, Sean, right? The problem will be this will then mean we've got to do something which famously Spurs have not done since um probably Sugar, right? And even then, a lot of the like the marquee names of Sugar, we got when we weren't in company. When was the last time Spurs went toe to toe? with a major club. And if anyone says Dragasin or the new Swedish guy, I'll start screaming. 
Why? Well, hopefully these are little... It's a legit, it's a legit answer, though, right? We went yeah, we toe to with Bayern Munich. We went toe-to-toe with Barcelona. On the, on, the, on, the, on the barren ground of Levy land, hopefully little <laughs> green shoots are coming out. <laughs> but we are going to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Barca and Bayern and say, up yours, boys. We've got the player you wanted. Look, and we have... OK, so maybe I'm wrong. Maybe this is the sign of things changing. But what I'm saying is, right, I strongly doubt... How about if it's Timo strong, Werner with Man United? Sean, don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> you're better than, to quote Chris uh, Butler, you're better than that, you're better than that Butler. To quote, this, to quote, to quote uh, listen, we, we, right, if we have to go toe to toe with, say, Arsenal and say, maybe Man U again for Ivan Tony, are we going to do what's, ne what's needed? If we need to go toe to toe with Arsenal and Chelsea for Neto, are we going to do what's needed? I hope to God we can. And I hope you to reckon, God Danny? Kings of Danny? will mean we get there. I what, can't go, do it. Well, go toe-to-toe -to -toe with another club for a, a, a big player. We'll, yeah. we'll, never, we'll never do it. We won't. The, the, they've already... The, we've seen it before in the past. They've already come out and said that our transfer strategy is that we won't go... We won't go toe-to-toe -to -toe with... If Man United, and say, for example, was involved in a bidding war... If, if it's a bit in war, it's not going to happen. We're just not going to go for the player. Like if if you look at if you actually look at the players that we've signed in the last well, since since Ange has been here in the last summer, all of the players if they or he, actually you can go back to even when Conte was there, all the players that we've signed have been players that either have maybe one year left on their contract or they're they're in, the clubs are in a situation where they need to sell their players like Richarlison for Everton. Or, for example, um, Madison, he had one year left on his contract. They got relegated. Like, like we, we, Basuma, we would have never assigned Madison if he had four years on his contract, right? And it was £80 million. Pounds. That's never happening. It would never have happened, right? You're right, and, Danny. On, just Phil. one quick thing. You're right. But the only thing I would say, maybe Madison is a good example, but and not at the same time. I was shocked. And buzzing that we got Madison because I still thought he was going to go to Newcastle. Now maybe Newcastle already knew about the FFP situation coming down the line, but it's still the fact he's a quality player. And I, I agree. I don't believe we would have ever bought him if he had five years left on his contract and it would have cost us eighty million, a hundred million. But the fact is, we went out and got James Madison. Anyone else could have gone yeah. and got James Madison if they wanted to. It's not our fault. You're shit. To quote Gaza. But the thing is, we're like in a way, we're lucky we didn't have competition from Chelsea or Arsenal or Liverpool for that amount for James Madison, because even Arsenal fans were saying they would have liked to have brought James Madison in. So, yeah, of course, it, we're, we're, we're in a way we're lucky we didn't have that competition because I reckon if we did, it would have been a different story. And then, then, then it's a matter of where was Newcastle though, Danny? Is my point? Yeah. You know? well, this is, like, well, this is exactly it again. But is, is Newcastle somewhere where James Madison felt he wanted to go? Maybe he wanted to go to a London club like being Chelsea or Arsenal. I think, or no, I think there was an element of that because I think of his partner. His partner's American. Yeah, for, he wanted to be based for, in London. Well, this is ex another thing, right? So every player's got different circumstances. But if you look at the players that we've signed, we haven't, apart from, look, we haven't gone to like a top club and brought a top player. Like we, we, that's just not the way Tottenham tried to do business. And I don't, I don't think we'll ever be like that under this ownership. And that's just the way it's always going to be. Like I reckon that the way that you can see the way that they want to do their transfer business, they want to try and buy the the youngish kind of really talented players if they can get them in. If they can't, then they'll go to their plan B or plan C, which might not work out. But if you go for your top target, there's a there's a bigger chance you're gonna it's gonna work out because they're a better quality of player, right? Usually that's the kind of scenario you're in. So so like for example, I'll give you an example. Nico Williams, right? He's got a 50 million euro release clause right now. That Get is it. less that is less than what Brennan Johnson would we paid for, right? We paid 47 million pounds for Brennan Johnson, right? He's a and this guy Nico Williams is as Sean knows as you everyone knows, he's an incredible player, young player, right? He's young. He he fits exactly what we're looking for in a winger. He's he's gettable, right? So all you have to do like it doesn't matter if you're competing with Man United or whatever because at the end of the day they might be able to pay more wages than we could offer because we're not going to offer the same wages say United or Chelsea will, will offer. But it's the other things we can offer. We can offer him more guarantees of football, first team football, and that maybe the style of play is better suited to what he wants. 
So th that's what I'm saying. Like, there's elements of of players you can go and get that are gettable, which kind of ties into what I what my stance is on this hundred million thing that people were talking about. Is that for me? Yeah, I was pissed off by it. It's not not I'm not I'm pissed off by the fact that they've kind of just said no, that's it straight away. That's not going to happen, right? It's not. I'm not trying to say go and spend a hundred million on a player because you don't really need to if you go and get the right players, right? Um, you can go and get. You can go and pay a hundred million pound right now. You can go and get Eze and Nico Williams right now, like, and you'll sign two top, top young players who will actually transform our attack right now. And, and that's what I'm saying. Like, but are Tottenham even going to do that? So it's like that, that. That's that's my biggest problem. Are they going to keep targeting these really, really young players who have, maybe have got some kind of potential or they see something in them? And they're you need not to really... sprinkle a little bit of uh, of, the, of the young with the old. You can't. You, I yeah, think that definitely. You look, you look at some of the some of the issues. Really like have Chelsea, Sean. They've just gone young. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah, they're too young, and there's no exactly. leadership on that pitch. I think that even you can you can have like top quality players that are young, but I think that there's some there's currency in one or two players that are like. 29 30 that have been yeah, there before listen, that can just kind of the, calm the biggest, the form and steady things when things are going wrong when momentum before. shifts you can reset recalibrate I, I think the biggest problem is with modern spurs was when levy switched the taps off for those 500 mm. days because mm. our model was going out and find like we're doing now going out and getting young gems bringing them into the team growing growing but we switched the conveyor belt off mm. and you cannot do that if you're trying to get young gems, bring them into the team, make them better, sell them on. You know, if you want to be... Basically, where Spurs need to be now mm. is almost like the uh, the Borussia Dortmund of England, right? Saying to the best young players around Europe, come mm. and make a name in the Prem at Spurs. and then Yeah, you but how many of them are getting the spots in the team? Like, you look at... Um... Yeah, but Nico Williams is a great example. Say to him, you're going to get good wages... You you're going to be in yeah. the best city in Europe, and you're going well, to. Be, yeah, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure if Ange has demonstrated really any any um, willingness to expand. You know what? I think that the, the, the litmus test is going to be is this guy Bergeval. If he's come in with this big, I mean, look, yeah, Dragerson hasn't got a minute yet. Basically, he's got five minutes here or there, and you know, you, you've got to obviously respect the fact that Romero and Van der Ven have got a brilliant partnership and all that stuff, yeah. but. You know, if if Bergeval's going to come in, having turned down Barcelona on the promises of first, being in and around the first team, and then sits on the bench all season, or the, or goes out on loan, or something like that, I think that that that's meaningful. It's a meaningful dismissal of the whole process. What is the point of having a brilliant under twenty one team that's top of the table? What is the point of having buying all these young players if they're not going to get get the chance? And I, I also obviously I acknowledge the fact that when you're doing one game a week and everything is going is building for a Champions League finish to so get into the Champions League or whatever next season. But like I say, next season if Ange still doesn't give the youngsters a go to the same degree that he that we all think he should, or that the the idea that we're trying the project that we're trying to sell <laughs> would require for it to be seen as legitimate, then I think that's an issue. You know, I think that at some point we need to, <coughs> you know, if you're if you're pushing oh, this right. narrative, you need mm -hmm. to the rubber needs to meet the road, and you need to kind of um, do as you say, not as you do. So I, 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 I think listen, do, it's a very difficult thing. it's a very difficult um, equation to balance, though, isn't it, Sean? Because in mm -hmm. the end of the day, football is a very short term results based cool. business. If he loses five games on a, on the trot, and and is basically looking for a job, right? That's mm -hmm. that, you know. Uh, it's called show business, not show friends, right? He'll be gone. And, yeah. you know, you see, Jesus, you see a couple of bad results and Anjou is trending. It's you know, 100%, which is crazy. mental, absolutely yeah. mental. You know, why tweet that when you can tweet Levy out? I just don't understand people. <laughs> 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 I agree, Phil. I agree. Get it sorted. Well, listen, um, I did look, I, I'm just hopeful now we're in a situation where. We could mm. go and get some of these players. And look, again, I want Levy to prove us wrong. Go and get a couple, just in that those winger positions especially, go and get a couple of decent ones. Whether they'll do it because how many, I mean, Jesus Christ, we're collecting wingers like um, probably Danny collects phone numbers when he's out in a nightclub in Amsterdam. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Um, lads, listen, we've been going ridiculous. for three hours. You know, they're not all good, fighting, but it's just like they're not all good wings, I suppose. 
Danny, I'll give you last thoughts, mate. Um, yeah. I know you've been coming late, but we got I've been going for three hours. I know we've got, we got to uh, wrap it up. Um, Danny, what's your what's report. your take? Are we ever going to sign up? Is is under Ange? Are we going to see a record signing? I think we might see a record signing, maybe in the summer. I'd, I'd, I'd to, be, to be honest, I'd expect to see a record signing in the summer if we get Champions League football. I don't think there's any excuses. Um, but we have to wait and see. I think. I think under and you mean, if, what do you mean record signing, Danny? Like actually break above our 60, record? Yeah, above sixty million pounds. Yeah. I, I, I mm, do you know what, Sean? If I'm honest, I think most of the top level players that we will sign will be around that type of figure. So it's hard to say whether we will break it or not because it will be between that fifty, sixty million pound type of bracket. So what was on Dombele? Fifty five plus add ons, right, or something like that. It was fifty five yeah, plus add ons. So. Maybe you might see a similar type of deal for another player. Like Nico Williams would be £43 million if you buy him now. Um, so that's already a top player. Eze, maybe someone like him would cost more than 60 maybe around that sort of mark. Um, so it depends on what... Yeah, it, it's hard. do you know what? It's hard to say, Sean. Like it's, it, it's hard to say because I think the way that Spurs will spend money on, on the, the top end of their kind of uh, allowance of what they would spend on one player is around that £50, £60 million mark. Like you saw it with Van der Ven, right? He cost what forty-seven million euros or forty-five million euros or whatever it was, forty-three. So mm. it, it's between that thirty to sixty million pounds bracket is where we're going to look to aim for players. That's the kind of range that we look at. Um, but my concern is that my concern is when Ange said that statement today or yesterday, whenever he said it, um, it it's like where. What, what I feel, and I've always felt this about Postacoglu, I, I always feel that he's going to get to the point where we got to with Poch, where we're, we're really competitive, we're challenging, or we're close about challenging. And then it's about, we can't, when you look at who's available in the market, who can you really take that's going to really improve that first 11, right? Because then it's a matter of buying a bench player, because in order to get better than what you're actually achieving, you need to get improved the first 11. So it's at that point where our Spurs going to go and spend that, next level bracket player like the 80 90 million type player who's like going to guarantee you that like Declan Rice for example you, everyone uses him as an example because he's elevated Arsenal for for what for this season right just an example right so Danny don't ever mention Declan Rice in my presence please <laughs> but, but look, look you can't you can't deny what he's what he's done for Arsenal though if you, if you, well, we'll see if it's meaningful at the end of the season, won't we? If, if they yeah, finish course, second or right. third again, then it's yeah, all enough. Danny, Danny yeah, I'll invite true. you to go back and watch the beginning of the stream if you want to yeah, take yeah. on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was, a, no, it was but, a clippable rant. Yeah, but, but uh, look, Briggs, like you can say, like, there's players out there that you, even if it's like 70, 80 million, I don't think Spurs will ever spend that type of money on a, one single player. I just don't ever see it happening. So it's like, like are they going to ever go out and really take that club to the next level. And I think we'll be at a point with Ange where it'll be two or three, like one or two maybe top players that go into that first 11 who then take us to that next level where you're really competing with and, the and top so level table. Danny, it's a good point, right? Because even if you were to say, even at the moment we're starting to get there in maybe the defence and the midfield, because if you're going to say, right, even from the, the players that you would, you know, most Spurs fans would say, pick in the starting um, 11 in the def the goalkeeper defence midfield, if you're going to improve on the midfield or the defence, even though we didn't pay the money for them, you're probably going to have to spend 80 million quid. Yeah. You're going to have to buy De Jong to get better than Benton Core or Bis, right? How much like, money... How much money yeah, I mean, are you going to have to spend? I mean, to be fair, the only yeah. problem, we, one of the problems we have is Sonny. To get a striker that is more clinical than Sonny, I, A, man. I don't think it exists. And no. B, like you are literally then going to have to shake hands with the reality. Another uh, Sean Butler special. Another two fingers in the Sean Butler drinking game, please. <laughs> <laughs> you're, in a, you're in a situation where you've got to say to Sonny, you might have to do more bench time than anyone else. But you're right, Danny. This was what went wrong with Prime Potch. He was lo too loyal to the players that we had in the end, mm. but also wasn't either wasn't willing or wasn't able to go out and buy players in, that were better than the starting 11. But, uh, yeah, there was also an element of the club as well his, during his time, right? Because that he wanted oh, yeah, to... Saying, it was, it was able, that he I wanted mean, to get rid of... Too. Yeah, this is another thing. So it's like... And like I, I, I'm, I'm gonna make my judgment on the board 
once I've seen a few years of Ange and seen what he is capable of doing under this tenureship, right? Because I, I know what my opinion is, what I feel is going to happen. It's what's happened with every, every manager we've had under this board. And I think the same thing is going to happen to Ange. But I want to I wanna give it this chance because if, if, if the same thing happens to Ange, that happened to Poch, that happened to the rest of them, Harry Redknapp, Mike, all of them, right? Then nothing's going to ever change. It, 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 will, it will never change. And I will put my hand down and say, there's no point like trying to discuss about chain, things changing at Spurs because it will not. It just will not. Danny, can I just say though, is, is there anything like, uh, again, like talking about bingo drinking games, like every fan of every club, right? But especially at Spurs, mm. I'm waiting till this summer to say, like every like oh, this is the most yeah. important transfer window. Of course, he's got to make the difference now. Of I'm course, like, every listen. This is the great thing about football. It's it's about what's happened before. It's yeah. about the heritage, but it's always even if, the minute you lose, you're thinking right. We've got to bounce back the next game. We've got to, you know what yeah. I mean. That's I, the, you know that's what, Bill, thing. I'll, I'll tell you what was happened. Right, we're, we're going to need three or four players right in key positions that we we need to get. It's clear and evident we need a number six, right? It's clear and evident we need one or two wingers. It's clear and evident we probably need another left or right back, right? Maybe a left back. It's clear and evident we might need competition for Madison. It's clear and evident we might need competition for Sonny, right? Or Richarlison if they decide to sell him, whatever, right? So there's already like nearly six players you need to get. I reckon out of the three players that we actually really need, I think we'll get one or two of them and we'll, we'll, we'll fall short again. And then it's like, then, OK, let's wait till next summer then to do what we needed to do the summer before and the summer before that and the summer before that. It's like, go and do the majority of your work that you need to do. You can do it in one summer if you really wanted to. If the club really wanted to do it, they can do it. They've got the money to do it. It's not that they don't have the money to do it. They, they can easily do it, but they choose not to. And that's the difference. And that's where, that's where I have the problems with the board. I'm not sure right? that's true. I'm not sure that's true, but that's for another conversation. Yeah. Guys, we've been going for three hours and uh, I've, got, I've got to wrap up. I've got, I've got loads of things to do. Uh, Danny, I want to say massive thank you, mate, for coming on. Let me come on to one for a little bit. Yeah. No, I, I mean, okay, you want me? Listen, this is the yeah, this definitely. is the first the first in the the new edition of On the Other Hand, Wicked. and every week I'm going to bring on different people to tell me that I'm a complete dickhead for thinking the way I do, and that the rest of the world is right and I'm wrong, and that's okay with me. Danny, you are more than welcome to be you know, a part. Do you know what, Sean? Do you know what, Sean? I want to just add one thing before you go because I know you want to go just on this on this ticket price hike, right? For me, I was annoyed at first because obviously everyone's going to have to pay more money for it now and the concession stuff that's going on. But at the end of the day, I've seen so many fans moan about it, right? And at the end oh, of the day, I minute. also think... No, sorry, Matt, you're one of these clowns that lives overseas has got a season ticket and sticks them all up on the exchange, aren't you? There we go. Uh, I, go, I, go to, I, I go to games, Sean. but... No one likes to go but... Sean. <laughs> <laughs> but... Um, I was going to say, yeah. You're one of the thing. guys that's stopping the rest of the world getting a season ticket. Gotcha. I forgot about I've that. Had a, I've had a ticket for how many years now? I'm going to keep my season ticket. I'm not going to let <laughs> no one take my season ticket. Dan, Danny's hey, actually, Danny's oh, actually one of the seniors. Fuck the rest. There you Danny's, go. Act, Danny's actually got phenomenal skin. He's got the Greek heritage. He's actually 70, right? He's, <laughs> he, he's, getting, a, he's getting a 50% discount. <laughs> <laughs> I wish, mate. I wish. But, um, but um, no, like with the season ticket price, I just think, uh, you're going to pay. Summary, you're going to pay the. You're going to pay the extra, aren't you? I don't. I don't. Do you know what, Sean? I don't care. Like, I don't care. Do you know why? Because that's life, right? Yeah, that is life. That is literally life. Everything goes up. People moan about it, but at the end of the day, what are people going to do about it? There's not much people can do about it, right? Like, you can talk about your favorite word, Sean, inflation. You can talk about uh, co uh that's cost not of my living. Word. Yeah, yeah. You can talk about cost of <laughs> living. <Christ>. <laughs> <laughs> drink, drink, drink. <laughs> I, should, I need my drink now. Um, but yeah, um, you can talk about all this stuff, but at the end of the day, right, the funny, the, the fact is, all the people that are moaning about it, they're still going to go and watch the game. They're still going to go and pay for their season ticket. They're still going to go and they're still going to pay for beers in the stadium. They're still going to buy merchandise. So why? They're just moaning for the sake of moaning, in my opinion. That's just how I a little bit of see, see it. I agree, mate. I agree. I agree. Listen, I'll get you one for the set on episode two or three mm -hmm. of On the Other Hand. Um, Danny, thank you so much. Phil, you're on mute. Massive thank you. Oh, he's gone. Oh, I, I was back. joking. I, I I knew I was on mute, but I was I was going. To <laughs> Danny, <laughs> listen, Danny, listen. If you can't see what Levy out are doing, why don't you to answer that? I came I over. To, I came over to the protest from Amsterdam. I know, of it. mate. But I was. What there. I'm saying I was is, there. Phil, right? 
all these people like the Tottenham Hotspur Supporters Trust, they're all moaning about it, yet they don't do effing nothing about it, right? Yeah, I know I in order in yeah. order to do things, right? I've said this from the day one, Phil. In order for anyone to do anything, you need a massive movement from the majority of fans, right? It has to be everyone in one go doing something. Whether that's a whole stadium walking out, it has to be mass, right? The majority that's of it. fans it's don't the only way the way gonna work. Do. And it's not gonna happen. The majority yeah. of fans are not Levy out because they don't think Daniel Levy's doing a bad job. This is why, Sean, it's not, nothing's going to change. And they're Nothing right. Happened. They are right. Daniel they're Levy is right. doing a good job. No, he's You're not. You're in the wrong. <laughs> he's not. You'll do it on another stream. <laughs> Listen, bro, how can, I trust your, how can I trust your judgment when you're wearing a hat and you own that chair. I, like, your judgment shot to pieces, bro. You're drinking non -al low alcoholic beer in that chair with that hat. Listen, I'm getting rid of the chair. The chair is being... The chair no, is being... It's brilliant. Um, it's a brilliant chair. Keep it. You've got to keep it. No, I'm keeping... I'm not getting rid of it. I'm keeping it. I'm turning my downstairs... I've got, like, a part of my house, a room in the room down the back there. Um, I'm turning it into a podcast studio. And so down there... You're going to have two of these bad boys. I'm going to get another oh, one no. in, and it's going to be there for when I have discussions in real life. Up here, we're going to get rid of this and go to uh, a normal chair again. And down there, it's going to be a smoking room, and it's going to be like you know, everyone sits back and has a glass of whiskey over a, over a Tottenham discussion. No, I need, I need to Bill, go Danny, there. you're I'm both more than welcome. Good. I'm going to come over you know what this reminds me of? Do you remember, obviously, um, you're both probably too young for this. Channel 4 used to have a late-night debate show where they'd get like uh, loads of different people on, like, you know, mm. some actors, some economists, different group of people. And they'd sit around on these um, Chesterton sofas and the coffee table was just full of booze. And they yeah, just yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, no, I'm, I'm going to have, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have a proper, a proper no, alcohol really. cabinet down there as well. Yeah, it's going oh, to be... Be be you know what? Well, that's crap that because Ollie Reed went on there, went absolutely mental. I think he almost killed a feminist. Oh, right, right. I, I mean, <laughs> I think I remember a, it. he massively, he massively offended her, but then it did look like he was going to like actually eat her. It looked like there was going to be some cannibalism. If but, this channel is going to get shut down, it's, it's not because of the lack of support for Levy or Levy out or whatever else. It's going to be because of mayhem that ensues following an open an open alcohol Listen. cabinet when I get you guys around for discussions next year. It's going to be I brilliant. We, we all saw that uh, Levy and Enoch out took over the, uh, you know, Sean Butler TV for a brief while earlier. So, you know, it's, <laughs> it's good. I'm glad you're, you know, you're shaking hands with reality, Sean. I'm, I'm open-minded. You know, this channel now is open-minded. Anyone who wants to come on and uh, and discuss. Open-minded open TV. Open-minded on the other hand. Uh, Listen, guys, I want to say a massive thank you wait, to both of you. We got around. Your, your Spurs and football debates are a bit like your dating profile, mate. Open to anything. <laughs> <laughs> and often uh, ending chaos. <laughs> <laughs> Lads, massive thank you to both of you for coming on. Um, Phil, Danny, you've got any social medias you want to plug? I haven't got your links up, but if you uh, if you want to uh, uh, shout them. I'll try and stay off the social media mate because it's full of like blokes who run youtube channels and and you know some good up people as well now look, i would just <laughs> encourage people to uh encourage people to be uh more levy out uh, just to put pressure on the old <laughs> dude. i'm sure he'll make he will make good decisions look pressure uh, this is a quote that i heard mm. recently pressure does two things makes diamonds and burst pipes so we've had burst yeah. pipes at white Hart lane let's make some diamonds yeah Put there some pressure go. on. There I go. agree. If, if you're worried, if you want to catch up with me on social media, just go and watch a, a Ric Flair video on YouTube. It's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, this, uh, this is like a, this is like a, throwback, a throwback to season one of uh, Spurs Talk Show. We were doing three-hour long streams. Uh, I love, I've love. i loved every minute of it, uh, Phil. It's been a really good conversation, mate. We're going to get you back on, as, of course, at any time you want. Danny, what's coming up on, uh, on? is it Tottenham on tour? Yeah, Tottenham on hey, tour. Don't, don't ask me about YouTube. I only come on now when I've got a moment. Otherwise, I'm working or doing something else or having a, having a beer on a terrace somewhere. You know what Danny is like? You know what Danny is? Danny is a bit like uh, Smokey <laughs> Joe Lewis. Ultimately, he, he is the power behind Tottenham on tour, right? <laughs> But he's never seen, never, never seen, seen in public. He's in yeah, a different yeah. country for tax reasons. Yeah, his ownership, his ownership of uh Tottenham on tour is a bit like smoking Joe's ownership of 
of Spurs <laughs> and Enoch. It's in a trust now. If anyone who's watched Succession, they're trying to hand over the, the you know, Waystar Royco is being handed over. But we all know who's still calling the shots. It's the bun. The bun has got the ITK <laughs> radar going around the bun. I got, I got to go. I got to go. We've been trying to shut this thing off for like three hours. I love you guys. Like, subscribe and comment. Get over to Tottenham on tour. Say thanks to Phil in the chat in the comment section below. Let us know how we did. See you on the next one. Nice of, on the other hand, this is it. See you later. <laughs> ciao, ciao. Thanks, everybody. Come on, you Spurs. Bye.